Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and the committee. And um, you, you just heard from me last week about uh, one particular bill, which is the extension of the merger deadline, involuntary merger deadline, from uh, July 1, 2019 to July 1, 2020. Um, I do have other bills, including transition <laughs> facilitation grants and evaluation of Act 46 and a moratorium. Um, but uh, as I spoke to the chair, I, um, our focus is, is strictly on the extension. So I wanted to just make sure, and that's H39. So if, if anybody individually wants to hear more about the bills and why I introduced them, I'm happy to do that. But I don't want to take your time right now. But what I did want to do is introduce um, Kara Zimmerman and have her come up and uh, just give her our perspective from, she is the chair uh, not only of the Stowe School Board, but she's the chair of the LSSU Board, Louisville South Supervisory Union Board, and chair of our transition board. So she has a lot of hats that she's wearing, and um, so I've asked her to come up, and the chair has granted me that uh, ability to do that. So Kara, if I could, you've heard me, you got my pitch before, so. Um, hello, for the Thank you. Tell us. Who you are, who you okay. My name is Kara Zimmerman, and I am the chair of the Stowe School District School Board. The, actually, the vice chair this year was oh. the chair last year, okay. but these things, we have rotating seats, um, of the Lamoille South Supervisory Union Board, and then I am also the chair of the Lamoille South Unified Union Transition Board. And I am here today on behalf of all the boards of the Lamoille South Supervisory Union to urge the legislature to provide those districts that have been ordered to merge by July 1, 2019, a one-year delay in implementation. I want to begin by thanking you, Madam Chair, and members of this committee uh, <coughs> for consideration of a one-year delay and emphasize that the delay is important because it would give us time that we need to provide the best services to our students, teachers, staff, and community members. The compressed timelines laid out in statute make it difficult to both appeal and comply with the law. In particular, the LSSU faced uncertainty as to the State Board's decision until the last possible day, giving us an even shorter window to prepare for a possible merger. Currently, we are moving forward on a dual path, both preparing to merge and preparing for operations in our current structure to reduce the likelihood of harm should we successfully appeal our case. We are doing all of this while also trying to keep normal operations on track. This is extremely challenging. I would like to take the remainder of my time to share with you what we are seeing and experiencing as school board members implementing a forced merger. <coughs> Our primary concern, um, as I am sure your primary concern is as well, is the impact of this short time frame timeline on our students. Um, to give you and I assure you that that is front and center in our minds as well. So to give you an example of how this could potentially negatively impact our students, we are um, very concerned that we will not have enough time to plan for our summer programs and for our meals for students. In order to properly plan for the summer, we need clarity regarding which fiscal entity should be applying for federal grants, hiring employ employees, and so forth. We are not likely to get that clarity from the legal appeal until May at the earliest. Preparation is particularly important in Morristown, where more students are eligible for free and reduced lunch, and many students participate in 21st century grant-funded summer programs, locally known as Unbound. It is also important in Stowe, where we are currently working with Elmore and Morristown to offer summer meals for all students in the region and to expand summer programs in need of, uh, for students in need of additional academic supports. We would hate to see these programs compromised in any way due to the current state of confusion and uncertainty. We also need to be ready to, to pay our employees on July 1. In order to do so, we must have systems set up and tested well ahead of time to make sure that we can take care of our teachers and staff. We're also concerned about the impact this is having on community members. As you all are well aware, community support is an essential ingredient for student success in excellent schools. And we believe that communities support their schools when they understand what is going on with them. 
The rushed nature of this merger makes it difficult to effectively provide the information <laughs> that the community needs in the small window of time we are given. We have many votes coming up that are critically important for our schools. Amendments for the Articles of Agreement, which will take place on February 26th. I actually was telling Heidi that I pulled out my notes from our last board meeting because we were even a little confused. Um, so on February 26th, we have a vote for the amendments for the Articles of Agreement for the new board. Then we have, um, on March 5th, we have board elections for our respective school district boards, which even if we are not, even if we are merged, we still need a school board who has care and control of the schools until um, June 30th, and then to do an audit next spring, uh, or next fall. On March 4th, the day before that vote, assuming the amendments for the articles, and even if they don't pass, we need to have um, the petitions will be due for the new board seats. And it's important that we make that deadline because we have to hold an election for the new seats on April 9th so that we can have our informational meeting on May 23rd so that we can vote on the budget on May 28th. Um, and also on March 5th, which is the day after the petition would be due, we have to vote on our local budget. Um, so needless to say, the, um, the process is cumbersome. And we are concerned that our community members will have difficulty <clears throat> navigating the multiple votes necessary to both continuous separate school districts should we successfully appeal the decision and comply with the law. The dual process is lengthy, confusing, and frustrating, frustrating, and we are concerned that taxpayers will take this frustration to the ballot box, which could result in program cuts for students. Frustration with the decision and process were evident at our organizational meeting, where some <coughs> citizens voted against every single act, even adjournment. <laughs> so um, uh, the merger will result uh, in increased taxes for Morristown and Elmore, and ironically, a decrease in Stowe. This is without any in increases or changes in opportunities for students because we operate two parallel K-12 through systems that do not share students. A tax increase in two of the three communities adds pressure to oppose budgets and cuts, cut programs. As an aside, our high schools are over 12 miles apart, beyond the threshold of geographic isolation as defined by the Vermont State Board of Education. So sharing resources is challenging whether we merge or not. We also have significant facilities needs across our supervisory union, but Stowe's needs are larger than those of Elmore Morristown, Morristown's needs. We estimate that facilities <coughs> needs in Stowe will cost around $24 million. This will add further tax pressure on the Elmore Morristown taxpayers and schools without benefits to their students, or alternatively, will drive program cuts. The compressed time frame for this forced merger has consumed 100% of board and administrative attention, taking our focus away from important priorities like the ongoing implementation of proficiency-based learning and social justice initiatives. In the Lamoille South Supervisory Union, we understand the importance of working together regionally and are committed to doing so. But we need a process and a time frame that allows us to do so in many in ways that benefit students and learning. The forced merger process, especially when you compare it to the voluntary process with which we are familiar, does not allow for positive, proactive planning or even a sustained focus on students and learning. A delay will allow time to plan for merged operations in ways that include clear communications, thoughtful plans, and community engagement while the legal questions are resolved. Our experience with the Elmore Morristown merger tells us that even if the forced merger moves forward, we won't have adequate time to properly implement it by July 1, 2019. We are not confident that the court will resolve our legal appeal by July 1, and even less confident that it will be resolved in time to provide a smooth course for summer programs and a smooth start <coughs> to our operations next school year. And that is all that I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so you were kind of going over your timeline here with all the various dates, and 
my reaction was you seem very well organized and prepared actually to move ahead with the merger because you've got all you've got all your ducks in a row, and um, but yet you're continuing with the with the dual process. So all I mean, some of the things that you had said, the challenges of, of what fiscal entity should apply for federal grants, um, uh, and some of those would almost be solved by following the deadline set forth by the state, just because you're already fairly well organized for it, and that if you had, it would, it would provide you with one legal entity to apply for money, um, and whatnot. So I'm just, um, I, I'm just, it, it sort of, it, it's a kind of a dual thought process as well as well, a dual. So excellent question, um, and the reason why it doesn't actually provide us clarity rushing this through you know, in the next few months is because we're all set up to merge if we need to, but all of the work that needs to be done to actually make us one fiscal entity and then have to undo that fiscal entity should we be successful in our court case. Um, so can I, so when you say that, that makes, what I, what I hear from that, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that in fact um, the, that says to me you actually don't want to merge ultimately because you're talking about being successful. Well, if we are successful, we believe, we, we still believe our communities and our school boards still believe in the proposal that we put forth two years ago. And that was based on a really comprehensive self-evaluation, which was based on nine years of study. So unless there is new evidence in the ongoing work of our school boards, <coughs> we're still incredibly committed to that proposal. But we want to be prepared because our first commitment is to our students. So we need to be prepared no matter what happens. But if, we, if this were delayed a year, we would be going into this next school year as two separate school districts. But with votes and everything in, in place and communicating with the community so we can get the community to understand what is happening, we can get community support on some of the you know, articles where we do have um, some leeway and some say, and we just feel that we'll, we'll start on a better, on much better footing. So an option to consider <clears throat> is one, we could do something about a delay now or we could wait until the court and then find out what we need to do. I guess the concern <coughs> there is that when I just laid out that very compressed voting time frame is, you know, to have strong school boards, which are, you know, the foundation to strong schools, you need to have people understand, you know, the new board and the composition and, the, you know, the purpose of the new board. And then you have to have time for people to consider if they want to be on that board. It would be helpful, especially when we're learning to work um, as one board over these three districts, to hear from the people who are running for the school boards so that, you know, everybody sort of understands where everybody's positions and their priorities, but this is going to happen for us in an incredibly condensed time frame. And I would argue that this initial board is really critical in transitioning from two school districts operating under a supervisory union and two really, you know, good size by Vermont standards. So I would argue that it would still be too late because it forces us all into this compressed time frame and it doesn't solve the problem of the summer programs. I'm talking about waiting until two and a half weeks, <clears throat> which is about the time that would take. Two, wait, wait, two and a half weeks is when we should hear something from the court. Well, not for our case. <clears throat> oh, your case is not. No. Oh, okay. So we're, we're not until um, April at the earliest. So that's really our problem, and that's what puts us in a <clears throat> tough spot for the summer because it's a lot of work to create a new fiscal entity, which would be the Lamoille South Unified Union. But some fiscal entity needs to be applying right now for these federal grants for these summer programs. Some fiscal entity needs to be handing out teacher contracts, paying teachers. So we need to be ready to rock and roll with that. And you know, our <coughs> supervisory union does have experience with creating a new fiscal entities. And that transition 
and what we learned through that process is that you need time. And so this is a different process for us. Have your, have your business folks said that they can't pull that off? Um, it would be very difficult to pull off. I don't want to say can't because I don't want to throw mass hysteria into our system. <laughs> we, you know, we need, we need good teachers and, you know, we need for parents who count on those summer programs for their kids to feel confident that we'll pull that off. So we'll do what we can, but it makes it far more difficult and there is concern that students will be negatively impacted by this. Thank you. I'm going to... Um up here. I'm mindful of the time and we have another group coming in at two and I know that we want to hear from Representative Mariki and, and a couple of others so I would like to get move Thank on to that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. No, we're, we're doing the human puzzle. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Yeah. Pr primarily, I'd like to to echo uh, Representative Sherman's okay. uh, request that the this delay be be considered. Okay. And uh, so, rather than presenting those bills, you, you, you're focusing on a delay. That's, that's right. I just would like to share my perspective. Uh, How do you spell your name? I'm sorry. Uh, M R O not M O R W I C K. It's on the agenda too. Yeah. Okay. And if you can pronounce it in Polish, I'll. <laughs> it's Rawitski. <laughs> we good? Yep. Thank you. And, and I don't have my testimony out yet, but I'd be glad to email it if people oh, subsequently you. like to do that. Do you so, have it in front of you, and you can send it to our to share? I will. So, uh, for the record, I'm, I'm Mike Morwicki, I'm state representative from Putney. I represent the Wyndham Ford District, Putney, Dummerston, Westminster. And this legislative district covers two current supervisory unions, Wyndham Southeast and Northeast supervisory unions. Um, I appreciate what was being said from the Stowe District, because our, our Westminster District that I represent is, is in a similar bind. Initially, their alternative proposal was approved by the Agency of, of Education and then uh, overturned by the State Board of Education. So their, their crunch is as real as anybody's since they didn't do any preliminary work feeling that their alternative proposal was what was going to go forward. Um, but I'm here primarily wearing my other work hat. The hat I wear when working with our children, both in school settings and out. The hat I wear working in our state's Family Services Division. Department for Children and Families, what in other states is more succinctly referred to as child protection. I'm here to affirm that whether I'm at work here or outside the State House, my life and work is dedicated to keeping our children at the center of the circle, what I care about. Switching hats, I'm also here on behalf of the tripartisan group of legislators, Republicans, Progressives, and Democrats, and we urge approval of pushing back the deadlines for compliance here. For those schools that have merged, we're not looking to change anything. They've merged, they've gotten their incentives, they're moving ahead of the back. We're not interested in changing what they're doing or affect their worker situations. The schools and districts that are not settled, though, need more time to better serve our kids. We're at the stage of enactment with Act 46 that might be similar to the last mile broadband service so many of us are trying to get for our constituents. It's difficult at best, there's no easy solutions and it takes time. And that's the main point we're making here. We need more time. The low-hanging fruit's been picked. The more difficult situations are remaining. Making this even more difficult is the flexibility many of us feel is written to Acts 46 and 49 has not been evident, as Westminster has found out. We're hoping that with more time, we can utilize the flexibility that Act 46 and 49, in fact, have. Putting my other hat back on, I'm here especially as someone who now counts the time I've worked with kids in decades. I'm here because every day those children are in the center of the circle for what I care about. 
and working with young children whose lives are filled with trauma and that these children, unless you work in child protection, you would be shocked to hear the details of it. These are the children I'm hoping we can get more time to work things out regarding Act 46. These children need a variety and level of services we would hope all our own children would ever need, but when their lives are one trauma after another, it's necessary. Here's why I ask how these children, especially in Vernon, where I work with several children, how are they going to be best served when the town of Vernon is being told to merge with the district an hour's drive away? Wish you would think about that and contemplate how you would feel, for instance, if Shelburne was told you're merging with St. Albans, if R R Rutland was told you're merging with Randolph, if Cornwall was told you're merging with Northfield, if Starksboro was told you're merging with Stowe, if Essex was told you're merging with Hardwick, if Manchester with Springfield, Milton with Morrisville, and St. Albans with Virgins. That gives you a sense of what's happening. Vernon is being told you're merging with the Central Supervisory Union an hour's drive away in Townsend. Back with my child's advocate hat on, I ask how does this serve our children better? These are children with trauma and special needs in Vernon. Right now, they get special services through the Brattleboro District, the next town over, and not have to worry that the center of their services is going to be an hour away. These children get an array of services, some in school, some out. <coughs> but one of the desired outcomes for these children is to keep them local. By that, I mean not having to place this child in an out-of-town or even out-of-state placement. How is this child, whose life is already chaotic, best served by moving the town into a merger with a district an hours away. Will those same services still be available in the next town? Or when specialists are needed, do they have to drive an hour? Or do the children? That's why I'm here. To keep this child and others like them in the center of the circle of what we care about. A delay may mean some inconvenience with some administrators, some business managers, but frankly, that's not why I'm here. I'm here to speak for these children and most especially the children in similar situations. If we're going to keep them in the center of the circle, what we care about, I'm asking for more time to get to the best place we can to serve them. Questions? Yeah. Um, sorry. Uh, you brought up a few um, uh, schools. So the Vernon situation, uh, um, under the state board order, they would essentially be orphaned from the called Brattleboro Area District. That's right. And they would become part of a different SU. That's right. And which SU was that? The Central, which is headquartered in towns in Leland and Gray. Okay. Um, we've been together for 50 years, gotten along well as a supervisory union. The alternative governance structure that we have offered <coughs> includes Vernon and keeps us whole. Did Vernon want that? Well, that's becoming more and more clear that they would prefer that than to be an orphan. I can't speak for them here directly, but I feel like uh, working together, we've, we're making good progress in that regard. Representative Austin, excuse me. That's okay. So um, I'm, I'm wondering why did Vernon get like a geographical waiver? Wasn't there like a condition where if you had to travel far distances? Well, we understand that too. Vernon has been a choice town for for the 50 years that be here. They're on the they're on the Massachusetts border. The closest high school to them is actually in in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. But 80 percent of their kids go to Brattleboro. Um, some of them went there. At, at this time, they weren't ready to give that up. And, uh, <coughs> within the alternative governance structure, though, Vernon participated in that. And, and we feel like with some time, we could get to that point where an alter alternative governance merger would be able to be worked out and keep us whole. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I work with uh, a number of kids in the <coughs> And for a town of its size, uh, I'm pleased to say Vernon people generously take on a higher number of foster families than other surrounding towns. So there's a lot of children like that. And, and children who have finally seen some sense of stability, but they need a lot of services. Um, the array of services is, is 
really hard to describe because it's so consistent and frustratingly not always uh, as effective as we want, but they do a great job as they can. And like I said, Brattleboro is the next town over. When extra services are needed, it's right there. <coughs> And you're before us today, um, not necessarily to present those bills, but to say that you're seeking a, an extension, That's right. a delay, is what you're asking for. I will say that some of those that have merged have talked about how doing so actually improved access for, for children. So, sure. so I hear that that's a concern for you. That's been a concern for some that have merged and they found that it's working sure. better. Have, have any been that far apart from the district they were forced to merge in? Um, I'm not speaking about about Vernon in particular. We're talking about about your your group that I see. We're talking about this group down here, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, there's Roxbury and Middlebury. Uh, excuse me, I'm not Pelier. Um, Addison is, you know. But but again, we're not. Excuse me, we're not here to argue uh, the value of Act 46. You're here to say, please offer a delay. Yeah. Correct. I am. Yeah. I appreciate your consideration. Representative Elder. Um, I am just curious, for you, the difference between a, a, an extension and a moratorium, because it's language I've seen in both bills, I see you are sponsors of bills <coughs> in each. Could you just speak to what the difference really is, as, as you see it? In real terms, I don't see it as a difference. Uh, if what we're asking for is more time, so I, I, <coughs> okay. we could parse the language here. but. But not a significant difference. I don't, I don't see so. And, and again, I don't know that we're trying to get away from our debate. You know, I, we do feel there was an alternative proposal that would allow us to merge and keep us whole, and that would be the best outcome. You are in the joint lawsuit, correct? In the uh, thirty-one. Um, uh, two of the three towns that I represent standards. are in yeah. are involved in litigation. Yeah. Um, and I guess my question to you is, uh, right now the court is supposed to be providing some guidance on February 15th. Um, the question before us is, does it make a difference to do something now when it's probably going to take us two weeks, mm -hmm. given, as you know, our process well, in terms of finishing it here, waiting a day, getting it on the floor, waiting two days, waiting a day to get it over the Senate. The Senate takes it up, takes it Let's not even go there. So, okay, <laughs> just, just, just to say, um, we're going to know more in two and a half weeks, which is pretty close to the time that we would get something through. Um, so I'm wondering <clears throat> what difference that makes to you. Why, um, why, why we should do something sure. when we're going to know in two and a half weeks. If that was indeed certain, I would agree with yeah. you, but the, the courts can work like we do at times. Mm -hmm. uh, so I feel like we're trying to put this in the hopper, so we're ready to go. Thank you. I just one more clarifying question. Westminster is not part of the putney Dumberston merger. They've been in a different... Uh, scenario, they're in a different supervisory union, <coughs> they originally got the alternative governance approval by the board, and now they're being told to merge with, with Athens and Grafton. Okay, and their, their alternative that was a, that was given preliminary approval by the AOE was to just remain For alone. stand alone, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you very much, you. and thank you for your consideration and time here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so basically what I'm understanding is that the three bills, H3940, 40, 41, 42, <coughs> the sponsors are looking to mainly just focus that on a request for a delay. Okay, so I, I, mean, I believe we will have our um, Ledge Council go through those with us at some point, but it won't be today. <coughs> so I think that takes us to Representative. <coughs> Partridge, and you have Act, you have H78. Representative Partridge, would you like anything on the screen? Mm -hmm. Representative Partridge, what's up? Do you need anything on the screen? <laughs> no, great, thank you. Thank you. I did bring a copy of my testimony. Can you send it electronically to the person? Sure. Okay. <laughs>
I can try. Um, <laughs> I had a heck of a time this morning trying to get this all organized and get the printer down the hall to work. And anyway, I think I got a few more gray hairs. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members, for the opportunity to testify before you regarding page 78. An act that proposes to place a moratorium on school district mergers ordered by the State Board of Education until legal issues are adjudicated. For the record, my name is Representative Carolyn Partridge. I represent the towns of Athens, Brookline, Grafton, part of Northwest Minster, all of Rockingham, and my hometown of Wyndham. As a legislator, I voted for Act 46 and Act 49. As the chair of the Wyndham Elementary School Board, I also understand why a moratorium or a one-year delay in the implementation of the State Board of Education's order of November 30th, 2019 is necessary. Number one, common sense requires the delay. The Board of Education's order of November 30th is subject to a court appeal together with affirmative claims brought by most of the parties affected by that order as to the statutory, their statutory right under our democratic system. There will be a hearing on February 15th on the school district's motion for a preliminary injunction. If that injunction is granted, all merger activity will cease during the pendency of the case. If the motion is denied, that denial will be immediately appealed. In the meantime, the main case will continue to go forward. The court is ultimately being asked to reverse and enjoin the state board's order and declare it unconstitutional on several grounds. Among the other issues, the appellants challenge the validity of the agency's default articles of agreement, which purport to permit the new union district boards to transfer debt and funds before June 30th, 2019. Real estate must all be conveyed no later than June 30th. The parties also challenged the validity of the powers of a new unelected transitional board, which claims to have the power to negotiate contractual agreements, spend taxpayer dollars, borrow funds, and to exercise municipal power in all planning, transitional, and other related duties prior to July 1st. The Agency of Education will be beginning a process to commingle capital reserves, debts, and other liabilities and assets in their districts. Boards that may ultimately be deemed illegal will have begun to make staffing decisions, contract decisions, even borrowing decisions. If elections for new involuntarily merged districts are held, they will be warned by an unelected transitional board something that Vermont has never, ever seen before. It is truly unprecedented for a state agent agency to have invented an election process that is nowhere found in statute. The process for counting and reporting votes in such an election is entirely invented by the agency and has no basis in statute. As that process goes forward, it may be the subject of further litigation. Because that process proposes to commingle and dilute the votes of individual towns, it will be extremely difficult to remedy the harm to voting rights, which would be constitutional, a constitutional harm. If the appellants prevail, any attempt to return to pre-merger conditions would be like putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. And trust me, the appellants will insist on putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. A moratorium is the safest, surest way to give the court process time to resolve the merits of the appeals. It will avoid the potential problems of having to ask the court to order the undoing of spending and borrowing decisions made by unelected transitional boards. If we allow a one-year delay for implementation the status quo will be maintained, and the court will have time to consider well-researched briefs on both sides. Schools will budget and operate just as they have done before, 
Districts that have chosen to merge can move forward with that process. There is no harm. It is the best course for assuring consistency and stability for our students. This is why we all, pro or con, simply need the moratorium, or at least a one-year delay until the court ca case is resolved. Number two, voting processes required by law are now being ignored. The Vermont statutes mandate that articles of agreement for new unions allow existing districts to the right to vote on the transfer of debt and property. Neither Act 46 nor Act 49 ever repealed the voting requirements with respect to articles of agreement. The Agency of Education, in their default articles of agreement, which weren't sent through rulemaking, ignored existing statutes that were never amended or repealed. Existing statutes involve a fundamental right, the right to vote with respect to the transfer of debt and property. The agency itself informed the board that there wouldn't be time for forced mergers to adopt anything but the default articles. Without the General Assembly's explicit authorization, no agency has authority to rewrite laws, particularly where they relate to voting rights. This is the duty and responsibility of Vermont's elected responsibility representatives in the General Assembly. There is another issue involving, involving small schools grants that even the agency is asking the General Assembly to look at. It is imperative that the General Assembly revisit these issues. Number three, budget chaos. <laughs> Within the districts affected by the State Board's order, there is currently chaos surrounding budgeting. The agency has been telling districts they must do merged budgets and that they may not do individual budgets. Financial managers have told us that they have received advice that they can't do individual town school budgets for existing districts. In most of these districts, there is no transitional board and no merged board to approve a merged budget. There are only existing boards empowered to approve budgets for existing districts. Any district should have the power and the right to plan for the contingency that the appeal of the board's order may be successful. But as a result of directives from the agency, even though the law requires budgets to be presented by town meeting day, many districts will not be in a position to present a budget at town meeting. Number four. The agency and the board seem to ignore the law that we wrote. Section 9 of Act 46 said that districts could retain their, their current governance structure if they were meeting the goals set forth in Section 2. Section 10 of Act 46 then went on to say that the board should be merging districts to the extent necessary <coughs> to meet the goals of Section 2. Numerous communities came forward with clear and convincing evidence that they were providing excellent academic outcomes with great fiscal efficiency and with growing student populations. But instead of merging districts to the extent necessary, the board openly acknowledged on page six of its final order that it merged districts to the extent possible. Now, I don't mean to disper disparage the board. They are among our finest citizens, working essentially as volunteers with virtually no staff or budget. Meeting once or twice a month, they were commissioned to evaluate thousands upon thousands of pages of Section 9 proposals that were put together by dozens of communities, each investing hundreds of hours in that endeavor in good faith. And I can attribute to that because I wrote the one for Wyndham. Hundreds of hours were spent on this, including the survey that we did of our community to come up with the results. And this will be in House Agriculture and Forestry for anybody who wants to look at it. <laughs> Neither the agency nor the board ever developed any standards for measuring achievement of the goals of Section 2 in order to evaluate those proposals made pursuant to Section 9. Some of these proposals, which various communities had invested hundreds of hours researching and writing, were only read by a couple of board members and given very little time for consideration by the board when the board rules required that each be evaluated on its merits. 
I would add that the law we passed recognized greatly imbalanced debt and geographic isolation as barriers that might well prevent merger at this time. The agency and the board almost completely ignored those barriers when in places like, such as East Montpelier and Callis or Montgomery and Bakersfield and the town of Wyndham, these barriers are very substantial. In conclusion, let us all take the time to get this right for the sake of our students, their teachers, parents, and administrators, we need to set a more certain and secure path forward through this transition. Legislation, though infrequent, has been enacted during pending litigation, usually by not, notwithstanding 1 VSA sections 213 and 214. I would ask Legislative Council to research this, to verify accuracy, and provide examples. It has happened. Our schools and our children's education are too important to impose a blueprint for governance that will be in place for generations to come without taking a relatively short period of time to clear up these problems. Thank you again for allowing me this time to testify and present H78. Thank you. Questions? Yes, much of what you're talking about gets inside what's happening with your, your questions before the court. <clears throat> I just want to give yes. you some examples yes. of why it's important to take, hit the pause button, take a little time, and do it right. So in my question to you, it's the same. We're looking at hearing something from the court in two and a half weeks. And given the amount of time that it takes, as you know very well, it's a process through this body. Is there a reason um, that we should do this now versus waiting to see what the courts are doing, what the potential, you know, word from the court is in two and a half weeks? I would say that given that sometime around now, when our budgets are due, so that they can be voted on at town meeting day, I would say we need to do this quickly because it's for the good of the kids. And are you? Working on a merged budget at this point? No. Working on two, you're not working on two different? Uh, the West two. River Modified Unified Education District is, has its budget together. Wyndham has its budget together. Yes. Boston? I've heard in other testimony as well that the board members gave very little time and consideration uh, when the board rules required that each be evaluated and also that very few people read. Is there some uh, supporting data? Is there testimony I can listen to that I can see where that happens? I suppose that you could look through all of the, um, all of the videos that were taken mm -hmm. of the uh, State Board of Education's meetings. H78 would address um, two of the lawsuits, but not the third, not the Huntington lawsuit. Is that correct? It's not listed in here as being part of the pending lit litigation? Uh, I would have to turn to... It, it's not listed there, but it should be. Okay. Okay. Um, and so I just see that this basically would say that the, and this is call it a moratorium um, as opposed to, we've just seen kind of both. Uh, Representative Merwicki was saying, you know, either or. Um, I don't know if you have a different take on that or a moratorium and extension. I would, I would be, uh, I think that we should do at least a one year uh, delay and, and push this out to um, June 30th, 2020. Right. And in this bill, if I'm getting it right, it would be the later of. June 30th, 2020, or such a time as none of this litigation is under appeal? So my bill is very similar to the one that Heidi Sherman introduced, but there was a little bit of an addition. Uh, and I can tell you what that is exactly, <coughs> thanks to <coughs> Jim Murray. <coughs> Jim writes to me, your bill does the same thing, but in addition, requires the General Assembly, after the court has rendered its final judgment on the litigation, to issue a joint resolution approving the mergers. Um, without that 
joint resolution, the mergers would be stopped, even if the court finds that the forced mergers have legal effect. And I think that has something to do with the fact that really only the General Assembly can make changes in terms of uh, voting rights. I would turn to the lawyers to see if there is another reason for that. We can address that later. Yeah. Jim goes through the house. Representative Jim Batista. Uh, thank you. Um, you said uh, the extension should be at least one year. <clears throat> How long would you like it to go? I would like it to be. Um, I would like to be it, it to be in place until the court cases or the appeal is adjudicated. Okay. But a, a year will give us a better picture for you know uh, what's what's coming along. <clears throat> I'm watching the clock. Oh, okay. No, yeah. that's, all right. that's all right. I can, I can catch up with the okay. markers later. Thank you, Representative I really thank you, committee members and Madam Chair, for the opportunity. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For the record, I'm Janet Ansel. I represent Callis, Marshfield, and Plainfield. And um, I'm, I have, have two bills. I, I may have co sponsored a few others, but I have two that I've initiated, and those are the two that I'm going to speak about. Um, so they're going up there. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to do with that. Um, and two of my towns have kind of worked, you know, worked their way through at 46. So Marshfield and Plainfield, you know, went through a process, had a lot of discussions. Um, actually, both voted in favor of consolidation, but the towns they were going to consolidate with voted no. So um, they ended up without partners. And anyway, long story, their things are rel relatively calm. Um, it, this has been a much harder process in Calais, and we're part of Washington Central. Um, for those who are returning to this committee, you'll remember discussions last year about the disparity in debt um, among the Washington Central towns, people are nodding. Um, it's a significant uh, issue for us, um, and is, is um, the, uh, H43, uh, among other things, sets out a path for trying to deal with that. But I'm going to focus uh, not on that at the moment because, um, there, frankly, even if this committee acted right now, if there isn't a delay, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make any difference. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about the uh, delay and the um, evaluation, which are two pieces of H43 that I think are really important. Um, in H62, I'm going to talk about a proposal to um, require a town vote before a school is closed um, when there's a part of, when it's part of a merged district. Um, in my mind, the, uh, so I didn't tie my bill to the lawsuit, <coughs> and I did that purposely. I knew that um, Representative Partridge was going to have that in her bill, so I knew it was going to come in front of you. I was doing something much more simple, just saying, I think, that given the time frame, and I understand if you're sitting on the outside, it looks like there's been a lot of time, um, particularly since the state board uh, issued its order. If you're in, if you're in a town that's subject to the order, it doesn't feel like much time at all. Um, and in Calais, we never have actually voted yes or no on whether to merge, um, so we haven't had that kind of committee, community uh, sort of engagement and. Uh, dialogue that you really, I think, need to be able to be able to sort of uh, work through this step, however, however it comes out. Um, and so I think that for me, the delay 
um, is really uh, a, a, a bill proposes a year. Um, it's not tied to the lawsuit. Um, I think it's um, important when you think about what's at stake, which is really our kids um, and our community school. And I think that the time frame that we're in now, um, I'm not a school administrator, so I can't tell you whether it's manageable or not. Some people say it is, some people say it's not. All I can say is that I think for the community it's too quick. Um, and I, I represent a community that, um, that really needs um, time to have a discussion about what, they, what their kids need and what they want their school to look like. And we haven't really had that. Um, part of that, to me, that's also connected to the, um, the uh, proposal for a, a serious evaluation of Act 46. And when I say serious, my bill puts money um, behind it. I, what I would want to see is um, a, a contract with a third party uh, um, en entity, spill my water, uh, to do the evaluation. Um, I think it would be really important that people feel that it's independent um, and that they feel that it it's it professionally done. Um, the bill um, puts 500000 towards it. That came out of a conversation I had with Joint Fiscal. Uh, they've done these kinds of, not this kind of study, but studies like this. They're not cheap. Um, I mean, if you're going to have something that's worth having, you need to spend some money to do it. Um, the idea that I have is that the first, it would be in three stages. The first stage would be this coming December, which I think would help um, inform the discussion. If, it, if we have a delay, if we are successful in getting the delay, it would help us understand what those next steps should look like. Um, and the bill ties it to the goals of Act 46. Um, that, I guess the way I think about it, this is probably the most major restructuring, well, this is the most major in a lo really, long, really long time. About 100, about 100 years, I think it's probably 100 years. You know, we did Act 60, but we also did Act 60, and that was financing, not kids. Um, although some people saw it as both. But, um, but we did do kinds of evaluations of Act 60. This is a very major change for a great many people. And at the very least, I think we should understand whether the changes we're making um, advance us towards those goals. Um, so um, I, I, um, I, I feel that that's probably, um, in my mind, that works with the delay. The, the, it's you, give yourself some more time and you get some more information so you can make the best possible decisions. Um, the, um, so the, the other two pieces of the bill have to do with uh, allowing um, some kind of alternative and how to deal with the disparities in debt. Um, I'm very happy to come back and talk to the committee again about those, but I think given where you all are at the moment, um, that's probably not the best use of my time or yours. Um, so, um, but very quickly what they would do is they would allow a phase in of the unified tax rate or they would allow, they would have a, a legacy debt tax rate to operate uh, separately from the uh, base budget. Um, so it's kind of simple ideas, but it would require that they, um, that they negotiate that um, among the merging towns. Um, so, um, uh, do you want me to stop? For a minute, I'm sort of babbling away. Do you then uh, have questions and, and then go to 62? Yeah, 62? That'd be great. would that be better? Okay. Yeah, I just have a couple of questions. You mentioned the X60 um, yeah. review that was done by a third party. Um, I, you know, we did reviews of X60 of yeah. various kinds, and I'm not sure. The, the one I'm remembering um, is really had to do, it was post X60 and had to do with education and finance, and it was done by a third party. And it was probably long after, because we're looking at one of the things on a report, this is yeah. really new and it's hard to get a report when things are so new and things are, mergers are just happening. Um, I'm just trying to find Well, out what the, uh, so I don't know how many years it was and I could go back and try to construct different evaluation points mm -hmm. that we did with X60. Um, we also did a, a X60 uh, technical correction bill the year later, which was kind of a massive rewrite. Um, but the the um, my thought is that the first mergers really under this current process that we're in right now, which predate Act 46, happened as long as four years ago. Mm -hmm. So if to 
if you're doing a three-stage evaluation, to have the first stage, um, December 2019, means you're looking at something that's five years old. I think that's enough time to begin to figure out what your metrics are and look at the early merge districts and say, are, are we moving in the right direction? But the bill has three dates. It has, um, I have to go back and remind myself exactly what they are, but um, it has 20, 2019, so December 15, 2019, December 15, 2022, and then December 15, 2025. Um, so I think you really, you do need to do a long-term thing, but I think there is a, a good reason for doing stage one now, because um, we have we have merged districts that are already happening. Oh, somebody put that up there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wow. That's cool. Um, Other questions related to this? Like to this particular one? Okay. This is Sally. Yeah. Um, so H-62, this came out of just sort of general conversations. And, you know, I, I'd say in my community, one of the real concerns, um, there's certainly a concern about that, but there's also a concern that our school's going to be closed. We have a uh, elementary school, K through six, in Calais. Um, it's not big, but it's not tiny. It's over 100 students. Um, and it's a building's in good shape. I think it's unlikely that it would be closed. But it's a genuine fear that people have, that if you become part of a larger district and other people are going to make decisions about something that's really important to your community. And the more I talk with people, I, some people thought this was already the rule, that you you, know, you can't close the school unless folks in the town agree. Um, I know some merged um, uh, districts have made this part of their articles of agreement, but if you're in the situation of being merged involuntarily, I can tell you that you don't have any leverage in those negotiations. Um, you know, the state board's made its order, um, and there's <coughs> default articles of agreement that give you two years of protection, and you really just don't have any leverage. And I think, um, I think it's a it's a genuinely held fear, whether it's justified or not. I don't. I, someone else would have to decide. But I think the fear is, is real, and I and um, I I think some um, I, well the proposal here is to say is to do it indefinitely, and the way I've written it, it would apply to any merged district. Um, I, I can see an argument for limiting it to the involuntary ones, but um, but the idea is to say if you know if this unified board wants to close the school they should convince the people in that town that it's time to close. And if they can't do that, it's probably not time. Um, people, towns, do close their own schools. Um, and I think they will continue to do that. They don't do it quickly. They shouldn't. Um, and I think that uh, requiring a vote of the people in the town is, um, is reasonable. I think it's good policy. And I think it will um, allay some real fears on people's parts. So um, I'm proposing just to the legislature would just make it a rule. Do you know how many towns have actually closed their schools? Do you? I don't. A few, not not very many, like a handful, and they might have closed. Who knows? Um, I don't. I, I honestly don't think Calus is going to be closed. Um, not with a large board, not with a small board, um, but I can tell you that people are afraid. I have visited your school and it is lovely. It is lovely. <laughs> It. More lovely than other schools. <laughs> no, it's the most lovely right now. <laughs> um, H43 would also kind of give an opportunity for that, right? Because I understand that it would, during the delay, it would allow communities to adopt new articles of agreement similar to how they could yeah. have in the first, which is in our, the district where I am, we did include just that protection and we could do it um, so that. But anyway, so there would be a path for that in either bill, essentially. But there, one would be from the state, and one would be an opportunity for. Th there, there would be a path, but the truth is, you, you, it's if you're the little school that's worried, and you're negotiating with the big community, you just don't have any leverage in that negotiation, right. um, and that's what we're discovering. This has become a real sticking point in Washington Central. So um, I'm saying let's take let's take that off the table. Don't don't require the negotiation. Let's just say that's going to be the rule. One just to follow up on that that I experienced, and again just 
in one district, but the leverage that the small towns had in our district was that since they were part of the study committee and that was part of the Articles of Agreement, if other towns wanted to find themselves in a merged district, they needed to agree to that stipulation. Um, and I understand this is different, right. you know, but that, that was the leverage that those towns had yeah. at that point was to say, yeah. well, we're including it and, and it's part and parcel yes. with the agreement. You want to merge, yes. that's... And that's exactly the leverage that in the forced merger you don't have. Just, um, can you tell me what the cost per pupil for an equalized student is in Calus? Um, I, I, not off the top of my head. It's, okay. It has been uh, relatively low on, on, the, on the lower, it, well, I'd say it's sort of in the middle. Um, but I, I can find the figure for you. But I didn't okay, but if you know it's, it's in the middle. But somewhere in the middle, I think, is the right one for somebody from Cal. I think from your, your towns, I remember it. Yeah, I know. The lowest yeah, of that. That's here. I'm sorry. A little, yes. a little over 15,000. A little over 15. Thank you, Don. Mm -hmm. And see you, you back there. Yeah. I think you were also the lowest of, of your uh, merged district. Yes, we are. Yeah. yeah. Any questions? Okay. Thank you um, all so much. We thank are. You. Uh, we will be in discussion. We appreciate um, the efforts that. Everybody is showing for their towns, um, for their schools, and for their children. And um, the committee will be discussing whether we are going to um, move forward. No, we're going to go vote on electronic cigarettes, which is much, right. yeah. much yeah. easier. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> okay, thank you. We have, um, we need to clear the room because we have another probably similar size coming in in just a moment. Um, excuse me. Excuse me. I mean, I don't want to say a lot of words. It's not a lot of words. Yeah. Would you like to send your name? Thank you. Who are you? I'm the committee assistant. I oh, 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 I got you. Okay. <laughs> Dorothy Mayer. Y-L-O-R. Yep. And you're on? I'm a member of the council. <laughs> we just have to... Oh, no, <laughs> Thank you. All valid. All valid. All valid. All valid. All <laughs> it's a jumpsuit. Thank you. Stand up. Yeah, you know, we're in the right place. Oh my goodness. We have so much I wonder why. It's the bill. <laughs> Yeah, they, he just needs one seat. So, there's that's technically two seats. <laughs> they may be small, but they are two. I almost forget them. They're in my bag. Hey, yep. do you? I do. Who needs to charge up? Uh, well, I, I mean, I can give a courtesy charge if you need oh. one. Is there a, is there a... Well, you can either write one or let's see here. It's up to you. I can see that. Oh, yeah, either yeah, way. Yeah, there's no testimony over here. It's all the way to the Kukli, who just departed. The vice chair is no longer here. I don't know what happened to him. He went that way. He went that way. Okay. 
Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, over the weekend, um, as you know, our, our mission was to move H through H through uh, H three through quickly. We had it on the fast track. We had originally looked at doing a public hearing. We decided instead to go for the fast track and move this through based on work that had been done last year. In that process, we have over the weekend heard from groups that had things to add. Um, and you know, as, as, I, as I say to everybody, um, the, the legislature is very bad at lists. Here we are again um, with trying to make lists that don't, are not always inclusive. So um, I've invited, there was a, a group that worked earlier today, Dylan and I participated, I was kind of in and out, with a group to look at changes to the um, findings to address um, basically anti-Semitism, which is, which is a significant problem that's been happening in our schools. And if you go to the paper and look it up, you will find it. <laughs> um, looking at that, looking at an expansion of ethnic groups and maybe something with a data collection. So in order to help us inform us on that, we have a few people here to testify. And the first is Abba Ramey's Abby. Can't talk anymore. I'm a retired speech language pathologist. We <laughs> <laughs> can't put a sentence together anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so Rabbi Amy Small is here to um, from from Ahavi Zedek, which is the largest uh, temple I think in the state, correct? Mm -hmm. And she's here to to give us her input on that. So we very much appreciate Thank you. you making the drive down. Yes, and I hope that the roads weren't too bad. Thank you. For all of us, right? Yes. Mm. yes. Thank you so much. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here and your, your interest in working together on this and, and all of the good work that you're doing on something that's so, so important. So uh, I, uh, I want to just take a step back before I talk about the Jewish community and our experience uh, to talk about what our concerns are about other groups in Vermont so that our Jewish experience is contextualized. That is that we have spent a considerable amount of our time and effort in forging close relationships with the Islamic Society of Vermont, uh, uh, as I have with the Imam educational programs and social programs and religious programs shared with the folks at the mosque. And, and that's not only so that we come to know each other as friends, as part of the community, to appreciate each other, but also because I personally have been concerned for their safety. And uh, we're living in a time that feels fraught for some of us who are in communities that, uh, that are in other places in the country experiencing hate. And out of concern for the Muslim community, I wanted to make sure that our presence as friends and protectors is, is very much a part of our relationship, as well as uh, our mutuality in being part of a broader religious community together. So that's chapter one. Chapter two is my um, concern about racism in the state. I was in Bennington just, was it two weeks? I kind of lost track. Two weeks ago, um, when um, Attorney General T.J. Donovan made his announcement that there would not be criminal findings, cr criminal charges uh, brought against the white nationalists who had been uh, threatening and really taunting and, and hurting the family of Kaya Mars. Uh, Attorney General Donovan invited me to be there. Uh, and I, I, I took that as a strong statement that he understood that the Jewish community and the black community, we're, we're all in it together. It was a press conference that was held in the synagogue in Bennington that felt really important and present. It was very painful to listen to the stories of what she and her family have gone through. There's no question in my mind that this is the right moment to quickly take action to support her, her family, and the African American community in this state. And that the, the need to address racism educationally is really important. So I, I support that you are trying to move on this quickly, especially having stood with her on that day uh, and experienced what we experienced uh, together. We, we also know that there are other groups in the state that are experiencing 
um, misunderstanding or hate, and um, that that includes Native Americans. It includes immigrants, those seeking uh, refugee asylum. Um, in our synagogue, we have uh, ESL classes, and we're working on forming relationships with the new immigrants who come through our doors so that we can be a strong support for them with Vermont refugee resettlement. We work closely. Uh, and so for us, the experience of those who are coming from other parts of the world, running away from violence and from hate, uh, is really um, an important Jewish value for us to recognize our sameness together and to be supportive to them personally as much as we possibly can. Uh, we have also had great concern for Central and South American, Latin American immigrants, and we have in our synagogue a, a sanctuary working group that is focused primarily on how we can support those who have come to Vermont who are feeling um, uh, threatened. Uh, and this is an issue across our state. We are um, also working on programs and relationship building to support that community. There's a long history at Ohavi Zedek of education and collaboration with the LGBTQ community. So all of these are expressions of our values as a Jewish community, and as well as our recognition that we are all in it together. And so for that, I really applaud what you are doing, and I'm very grateful, as my whole community is. Now, the, the area that we feel needs a little bit different kind of attention is anti-Semitism. Uh, the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, uh, has statistics on that, many educational programs on that, and we've been reading about uh, how those experiencing hate across America in the highest number are Jewish communities and Jewish individuals. Those most likely to experience hate in schools or institutions are Jews, because we're Jews. And in fact, the Jewish community is feeling threatened, fearful right now. Uh, when Pittsburgh happened, uh, I can say that it sort of surfaced what we'd all been holding back as this, um, this feeling like, uh-oh, what's happening now? And now it was, ooh, it's here. And this great concern we have that we all need to be together in understanding each other and supporting each other. After Pittsburgh happened, we, um, in Burlington, organized a, um, a, a gathering. It wasn't exactly a vigil. It was, it was, it was a, a prayer and um, solidarity program that was held at City Hall. And uh, hundreds of people came spilling out onto the street in Burlington out of uh, concern for the Jewish community. And that was really important for the Jewish community to know that our community cares about us and shares our concern. One of the things that I found really interesting was that in the weeks after the Pittsburgh attack, we started receiving cards, calls, letters, floral arrangements, some from people we've never met and never had any interaction with to tell us that they were concerned for us. And that was very moving and very important. But it also flagged for us that this may have been the first time that some of our fellow Vermonters recognized that the Jewish community is experiencing a time of fear and some threat. And so um, the, the outpouring was, was beautiful, it was lovely, it was very, very, very much appreciated. And it flagged something for us. There's something happening now, and this is a conversation we need to have together as a community. I can tell you from my experience working with the families at Ohavi Zedek that uh, I've heard some very troubling stories of uh, anti-Semitic taunts of, that children are experiencing in school, bullying, uh, swastika, many swastika stories where th this hateful symbol of the Nazis has been um, thrown around as a way to taunt Jewish children in schools. There was a big incident in the Burlington High School 
uh, or just a couple of years ago, took a long time to resolve where one of the students was using the Hindu symbol from which the swastika was drawn um, as his symbol on his email account. And this deeply troubled the Jewish students who didn't see this as Hindu, but rather as uh, a way to mask um, the, the fact that it was actually a swastika. We had a lot of meetings with the superintendent of schools, with parents, with students, students who were feeling afraid to go to school. And um, it, it has come to our attention in a number of different ways that our kids feel like their friends may not realize what they're going through. And those who are not their friends, who may be uh, the ones bringing these hateful acts towards them may think it's funny, as kids may sometimes do, and may not understand even what the, this means, which is why education is so important. Being able to share uh, with kids what the experience of hate has been for the Jewish community, which goes back for 2,000 years. And of course, in the experience of the past century during the Holocaust, a time of much, much, much loss and sadness and grief in the Jewish community. And for the first time, members of the Jewish community are once again wondering, could this happen again? Now, you may say that that sounds irrational. This is the United States of America, it's 2019. And yeah, on a rational level, maybe that is irrational. But the truth is, the Jewish community isn't always so sure that everybody understands the threat that they are feeling, that they're experiencing. And when children are coming to school taunting other Jewish ch children with uh, anti-Semitic symbols and statements, it does really get our attention. We take it very seriously, given what we've been through. And so um, I've read what you had been working on, and I'm, again, really grateful that you're doing it, totally understand why you're doing it, and want to see this happen. Uh, I, I hope that in the attempt to be inclusive, that there isn't some inadvertent exclusivity. That is, that the Jewish community needs to be noticed in whatever language is included here in the best possible way. Now, if it were just about race, that would be one thing. But once you begin to include other communities that are experiencing hate, it's really important that the Jewish community is included in that. Once again, I want to remind you that uh, statistically, the group most likely to experience hate in schools and organizations and in the workplace are Jews, even more than the other communities that you've named here. That's the statistical truth. You mean that in terms of religious communities? Um, not all, not all uh, well, that, that's, yes, that's true. Yeah. Now, there's no question that the different groups that you've named here may experience hate in different ways. So, for example, somebody said to me that uh, I was talking to yesterday in the Jewish community, well, um, are Jews being pulled over by state troopers because, of the, because they're Jewish? Uh, obviously, as a way to make a point. And I said, no, that's not the case. However, the, the taunting of children in schools is, is, is something that's specific and unique to Jewish children and is, is uh, very, very deeply concerning. Yes. So um, the Anti-Defamation anti League is, is uh, a resource for this information, um, among others. And um, we certainly would be more than happy within the Jewish community to offer whatever advice, suggestions that we can, that we can bring to the table to help so that the bill that is eventually put forth is one that helps everybody to feel like they've been noticed and protected and cared for. Uh, I, I, I can, I'll just tell you one more story um, and then pause if you'd like to ask me any other questions. <clears throat> we had uh, a member of the um, Jewish community who's a parent in our Hebrew school, who's a school counselor. She came to do a talk along with a member of the um, uh, the, the state's attorney, not the state's attorney, the, the U.S. Attorney's Office, who specializes in civil rights and in hate crimes. 
and they came to talk to parents uh, so that there was some perspective on what individuals, families, and communities can do when they uh, feel that there's hate being expressed in the schools. So there was a school counselor and there was this attorney from, from the U.S. Attorney's Office. And um, there was somebody who had come, come into the meeting who was not a member of the congregation but had an interest in hearing what was said and raised his hand and said, I don't understand. The swastika is a Hindu symbol. Now, like for a Jewish ear, that's like fireworks go off, you know? We are still just a generation away from six million of our people being murdered. And that that swastika may have come, may have some similarity to the, to the Hindu symbol. It's a symbol of hate. And here, right in my own synagogue, somebody said that. I couldn't believe it. This is about education. And so I think it's important that this bill is coming out of the Education Committee because we need people to be informed and to be sensitive. I have a question. Um, Representative Jay. Hoover. Representative Hoover. <laughs> you can call me Jay. <laughs> For this, uh, could, you, could you clarify the distinction um, between the two? Between what two? The Hindu symbol and the... And I, I understand, I, I think, but... And I can't understand how somebody might suggest that that's a Hindu symbol, but could you? They, they have a similar appearance, but not identical. And um, it's twisted. There's some, um, some markings on the Hindu symbol that um, are not on the, uh, the, the swastika symbol. Sure. Um, the distinction is one comes from a religious tradition of the East, and one comes from the Nazis. Mm. That's the distinction. Right, right. What's that? It's a lot of the swastika and the Hindu. It's going in different directions. Yeah, it's twisted. So you may say context is everything, but when you have a child who's verbalizing hate towards other Jewish kids and uses the Hindu symbol, it's pretty clear that that was a way of trying to get away with it, but using a swastika. It just is really obvious to the Jewish child that that's what's happening. Right. And that has happened right here in our state. Questions? Yeah. Representative Austin? Hi. Hi. And I'm Jewish, so I just want, um, my main concern as a former school counselor and educator is that if, you know, why wouldn't a Muslim come in and say, you know, I would like you to be, you know, covering Islam? or Buddhism, or Hindu, or Satan worship. You know what I mean? Why wouldn't other religions, I mean, we don't want to get start comparing numbers, you know, who's being oppressed the most, or, you know, I, I understand, but I feel like if we open this up to all religions, how, what will be our argument that, you know, we, you, you don't have enough numbers, so we're not going to include you? So that's an excellent question. Uh, I, I haven't seen the language that's been worked on this morning, so um, I was sort of holding back, hoping that yeah. there was something that I could comment on. But that's a, I'll comment on it from your perspective, and I appreciate that. Uh, so the first thing is, that's why I started out by talking about our, our outreach to the Muslim community. Mm -hmm. We are concerned about the members of the Muslim community. And uh, in fact, the first call that I got after Pittsburgh was from a member of the Muslim community because of our mutual concern for each other. So there are two religious groups that are feeling threatened in America right now, Jews and Muslims. Mm -hmm. And others may say that they have had uh, discrimination, but they're not in the same ballpark. So that still doesn't answer your question. I realize that. Um, but it could be that you include religious communities who are experiencing threat or persecution or have experienced threat and persecution, such as those that are currently feeling threatened, Jewish community, Muslim community, and others. So in other words, you could adopt language that says, yes, we mean everybody, but we specifically understand that there are two communities right now in our state, in our country, and in our world that are feeling very overtly threatened. 
So perhaps you could adopt language that incorporates that while not excluding everybody else. We are working on that language. We're hoping that I'm trying to see if our, our drafter can come up soon. He's actually will be here at 345. I'm trying to get him in a little bit sooner. But sure. we are looking at, at some language that I think uh, will help. Um, and we, we are interested in, in, in your view of this. Representative Elder. And I mean, I would, it's interesting your, your uh, reaction to the idea that some groups are also secular that, and, and, and possibly culturally consider yeah. themselves Jewish. They may not be, this could be true of different religions, but that sometimes these groups are not necessarily a group of practicing together and organized religion, but just that that is at play as well and just kind of um, yeah. represented awesome just what made me think of that. That sometimes yeah. it's, not, it's not just um, who is an active member of a, of a religious worship organization. Absolutely. Um, it, it is very true that this is not about who's affiliated and who's active in the religious community. It's about how you identify. Um, and, and, and it's not just children in schools. I was just this morning meeting with a member who is a nurse at the hospital who was telling me that she has endless numbers of stories she can tell about uh, experience she's had working with people who are intelligent and educated and working in a very sensitive field who don't realize that they're saying things that are really hurtful. Um, and, and, and ignorant. So um, schools are a good place to start because this is where we're going to chart the future. Uh, but this is, this is a problem that's happening everywhere and it has to do with how people self-identify self and not so much of how much they practice that religion. So I'm curious, uh, I don't know how this works, so I guess you'll tell me if my, my suggestion, my thoughts about language resonate? Does that, does that feel like that's moving in the right direction, or are you not able to answer that I yet? Think, I think that's very helpful. Um, I'm wondering, um, Representative Jean Batista, if we might pull up some of that language without our attorneys here sure. first? Yep. They're all and listed. What? All okay. amendments are listed. All sure. amendments are listed. Are posted. Posted. Okay. So, so let's, sure. let's look at some of them. Where we have focused our attention is in the findings. We have looked at a number of things. We wanted to take thing, faith words out of it, uh, is one of the things that we wanted to do, because as soon as we start doing that, then we've forgotten somebody. Um, so you mean, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, does that mean that naming religious groups, is that what you mean? No, no just words. taking the word, at one point it was, uh, it was um, faith. Jewish faith. Ah. And we're trying to we're trying to stay away from that, for that example, makes sense. and we're trying to keep it as broad as we can, so that, that so that it can be inclusive, mm -hmm. and yet um, is addressing some of the issues. We did get from um, Doug Martin from um, uh, from Temple Sinai did send us some um, some data from U.S. Where is it from? Um, hate crime statistics that yeah. did note hate crimes in Vermont. Uh -huh. So this is a nice statistic that we have. And, and we, we're going to be doing it in terms of percentages from this day. It's not that many, but it's enough we can at least say percentages. <coughs> and the one that is the, the highest number of incidences are re, re, related to uh, race, race, ethnicity, and ancestry. Um, that is followed by sexual orientation, and the third is religion, and the fourth is disabilities. Mm -hmm. So that is a piece that at least brings into account that this is an issue. It's happening in our state, and we have some statistics on it. Yeah, that's right. Madam Chair, just to let you know that we have it on the screen behind oh, okay. you. And so you don't have to, yeah, so you don't, you don't to want around. to turn around. <laughs> whatever, whatever works best. Thank you, Kayla. So, so the, the first one has to do with um, citing some statistics on hate crimes. Great. And it does bring in that religious is one of those, religious orientation is one of those um, biases. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, the second one that we were adding, um, and you know what, Dylan, what I'm not seeing in here is we at one point had things about symbols, mm -hmm. and I don't see that we, we got that one, <clears> and I, I can't remember why. Um, the next one, um, the, 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 act, the definition that stands right now says ethnic groups means non-dominant racial ethnic groups in the United States, including people who are abnormal people from other indigenous groups, People of African, Asian, Pacific Island, Chicanx, and Latinx, 
or Middle Eastern descent, and then added this, as well as minorities that have been historically subject to persecution or genocide, which is it's some strong language. Um, it doesn't specifically name a group, but I think that a lot of people can look at that and say, that's my group. So that's one thing you can think about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we mm -hmm. hope to get this done by the end of the day. Um, and again, the, I, I want people to, to bear in mind, I, the group was struggling today, and this is what happens, is we could, we could kill the whole bill by be struggling on a word, and we want to make sure that we have another opportunity to address it, which is in the Senate. Um, and again, the most important thing that we're doing is establishing this group. So, thoughts on, on that. I appreciate that. This is really helpful. Um, yeah. I had seen that there had been one version of ethnic groups in a previous version of this bill and then an update, and this is yet a third. The, yes. Yeah? This um, is one that we're, we're looking at at the moment. Right. Uh, I think it goes toward that. Yeah. But once you've begun to name groups, yes. the fact that the Jewish community isn't specifically named, or the Muslim community, be, to be frank, um, it, feels, it feels like it doesn't quite do it. This is better. Mm -hmm. I see that it's better, and I understand. Yes. But given that those most likely to experience hate crimes from, um, from these various groups are going to be the Jewish community feels like there's something absent from my perspective. Yeah. Uh, and, and I understand the challenge that you have, and I don't mean to diminish in any way how hard that is, <clears throat> right. and I appreciate that. But if there were some way that, I, and, and again, I feel for the Muslim community as well, yeah. um, that that could be flagged because that's a current situation that needs special attention. I suppose that's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Some kind of special attention. Mm -hmm. our, our families are really struggling right now. They're looking for that. Will you scroll back up? I want to see. I don't think we did the next one. Yeah, we didn't do number five there, did we? <clears throat> OK. So here, number four here is, is in our um, findings, and that uses the statistics. Um, 51% racial, 23% uh, sexual orientation, three, um, third one was, uh, was um, religious bias, and the, the last one was um, disability bias. Mm -hmm. So that, that brings that in. The second one um, says the harassment of marginalized groups are, and the lack of understanding of people in power about the magnitude and systemic impacts of harassment and bias damage the whole community. That's another one. That, yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. Dylan, we had something about symbols at one point. Mm -hmm. What happened to that? I'm not sure what the status is with yeah. Jim's drafting, uh, yeah. but we could certainly look into it. We had at one point, um, mm -hmm. we were looking at language. Um, The top one. The first one. Uh, Madam Chair, yeah. we had, uh, in, in developing the findings, there was discussion this morning with a group of stakeholders and several uh, members of the body, um, and we had worked on language um, that would bring in examples of Vermont instances in which um, identifiable symbols of hate have been seen. Um, we had a lengthy discussion about the wording and whether or not we should name in the findings the word swastika um, and what positive and negative connotations that might have for a reader of the bill, but additionally if we were empowering use of that symbol by naming it. There was some consensus without speaking for others that referring to um, a symbol such as a swastika as a symbol of hate and putting in the weight of the, um, the meaning of that symbol and its relationship to the disturbing frequency with which we are seeing hateful symbols at schools, in public spaces, at places of worship, at farms, and in places of business, all of which are documentable, if that's a word, uh, uh, 
offenses that we have seen in the media in recent reports, yeah. that that might be a way to, again, convey that uh, symbols of hate have no place and are, in fact, damaging <clears throat> to the whole community. So we had worked on some language around that. There was general agreement that using the term symbol um, <coughs> would also address other symbols of hate. Someone pointed out that some people view flags as carrying um, a meaning and that that is a symbol for some. And we all know the instances recently uh, and the discussions in communities around the country about use of, say, a Confederate flag uh, and so on and so forth. So that's language as well that I think um, would be appropriate to consider within an amendment. And we do have some potential language that I could take to Jim if you'd like me to. Yeah, the, the way that the, the language read was swastikas and similar messages of anti-Semitism and racial hatred have in recent years appeared to appear to disturb in frequency at schools and public spaces, places of worship, farms and places of business. So it's a matter of how we're going to address the symbols, graffiti, uh, whatever, whatever we can do to get the language. Um, enough so that we can get the bill passed and fix it in the Senate if we need to. Is, is really that, that would certainly be helpful. Yeah. Um, it's certainly not only swastikas yes. that we're talking about, yeah. but naming it does help. Yeah. Uh, and if there's a way to, to flag that there are some groups that are experiencing uh, an intensity of resur a resurgence and intensity of hate, that um, had, because it has a history, uh, has people feeling very, very much afraid, would be really helpful for educators to know <clears throat> since this is about education. Right. So that they understand who they need to educate. Mm -hmm. And that's what the work group's mission will be. Their mm -hmm. mission is to be able to organize things around our statutes that they can be helping to maybe look at curriculum development and things that can go as model curriculum. Mm -hmm. This is what the work group is focused on, represented mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you feel that the term ethnic group, which we say here means non-dominant racial and ethnic groups, do you feel that, you know, because we're trying to come up with a carve-out within that category, is that umbrella even appropriate to defining a community? I'm very glad you asked that question because having been looking back and forth between screens, I missed that word. Um, I had seen it when I was studying in preparation for coming here. That word sets off alarm bells for Jews because they're one of the anti-Semitic canards that has been around for a long time is that Jews control the world, which of course we all know is not true and a total anti-Semitic canard. Non-dominant flags that. So I, I think ethnic groups, that's fine. But non-dominant, I think we need a different I don't know why we can't have minority, something like that. I, I guess somebody in the Jewish community yesterday said to me, did you see that there's this word non-dominant? Oh my God, that's yeah. going to be bad. You know, but that, that, that has a very strong response in the Jewish community. So let's flag that word. Again, I just want to say that as an educator, I've been on the end in schools where I, we've gotten you know, mandates from the legislature to incorporate this, mm -hmm. where the implementation is very different from this conversation. Yeah. And my concern is, really seriously, is that for us, even if we had three children of another religion, if they perceive, if those parents perceive that their children are feeling excluded, I, I think this opens it up to public schools to teaching all religions, or it, I don't want it to become a numbers game. You know, I, I understand the dominance piece of it in, in terms of the Muslims and the Jews, but I could definitely see this conversation being with a, a mother, uh, you know, that are Buddhist or Hindu, you know, where they're saying, but my child is, you know, feeling excluded. And I, I just want to avoid that. I, I'm totally with you. I think that there was language, whether it's this one or a previous one, I lost track about those who have had historical experience of persecution in this country. Um, is that there? Yeah. Which does begin to touch on that. I can unlock that if you want me to, <laughs> thank to you. refer to it. Yeah, um, about that. Thank you. Um, 
And if the language did flag that there are specific groups that are most concerned at this moment or most experiencing this at this moment, and others, if there's a way to create that inclusive language, the problem is what, just, just as you've just said, once you start to name any group, you're leaving out other groups. Right. So if there's a way to do that in a way that is not exclusive, that would be great. And I think it's possible. Either you name none, right. or you say, here are these that are most, uh, in this moment in time, most um, at risk for this hate. And of course we want to also make sure that we have inclusive education for, so that there's sensitivity about difference as difference. And that there will be the one or two students who have other faith traditions, and they should also be uh, the beneficiaries of this sensitivity education. So I, I'm going to do something I, I, I'm not supposed to do. I'm actually going to turn to the two other rabbis that are in the room. And I'm going to ask you as a group, in terms of the word non-dominant, uh, is there, do you have a thought on that? And if you could, when you speak, say who you are. Non-dominant racial and ethnic groups. We're looking at the word non-dominant. Um, my name is David Edelson. I'm the rabbi at Temple Sinai in, Bur in South Burlington. And I share Amy's concern that non-dominant, it depends on who's defining the group. Like it's, a, it's an amorphous term that can move depending on who's speaking it. So I, don't, I would think that something like uh, racial and ethnic groups that have ex uh, historically experienced uh, uh, oppression and yeah. uh, discrimination in the U.S. would be more inclusive and yeah. more fitting than dominant, which gets into a whole argument about who's dominant. And then just say, including people who are. Yes. Mm -hmm. We addressed it in that first sentence. Mm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Committee. So that other language yep. from the other place could fit here as well and, That's and right. resolve yeah. some of that. That's and right. we have um, Christian Demaray, our, our fearless um, lawyer who drafts on language. <laughs> hear that one? Get to work on that. Thank you. I don't know. Great. He saves us from ourselves all the time. So just looking around at the committee, are we comfortable with making a change, Representative Jim Batista? Uh, I, I just want to bring forward the perspective of the many hours uh, that I've spent with the groups who primarily have worked to bring forward this bill, first in a different vehicle last biennium where it failed to pass, um, setting the work back by many months when it could have began, begun in September and to the present point. Speaking for the perspective I've heard there, because I want to make sure it's heard in this discussion, especially with so many folks in the room that I'm very pleased are here, the word non-dominant, I think, if I could speak for the coalition members that I've had conversations with, is an important term to share to the communities, both represented within this building and outside of it, that there's a recognition on behalf of lawmakers and policymakers in this state that there are people in our society who have had little or no representation, or who have been in positions where their identities, for whatever reason, have been marginalized. And the use of that word, the way that I've understood it in working with members of the coalition and of the different groups who are named, um, that word carries a connotation as well of potential empowerment, because we are using the laws to name people who perhaps have not had the level of representation that we would like to see through this work. And I just think it's important to also bring that perspective. I'm not necessarily espousing it. However, as a, as a co-sponsor of the legislation we're looking at today, I'm aware of the heavy weight it holds for all of the groups who are named. I don't want to see any group not named. But if the work is to go forward, there is a value to the symbol of words that this body uses, that the laws uphold and there is a process of, I don't know if it's reproaching, I don't know what the right term is, but of setting right many wrongs that have existed, that continue to exist, that this bill acknowledges need to be fixed in our education system. And so that's, that's just an important piece that I'd like to share with the committee. Can I make yes, a yes, suggestion? Yes, please, Jim. Okay. <laughs> we can break this, this uh, definition into two parts. Yeah. So I think it means, and then A, 
non-dominant, etc., down to here, and then B and minorities that have been historically. Mm -hmm. So you keep the non-dominant with this part, and you don't comprise mm -hmm. the non-dominant with this part. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I was thinking. That it looks like that could be two parts. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's probably wise. Do you think that will pass most of the coalition? Uh, I can't speak for yeah. the other stakeholders. Okay, so we'll have to follow up with them to make sure that's okay. Madam, Madam Chair, um, you had asked both rabbis. Yes. Yes, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, wanted, I wanted to know <laughs> what his thought was. Rabbi, would you like to add to this thought? I don't need to add to this particular, Yeah. Okay. but happy to share other thoughts whenever I'm called on. Will you just share your name for the record? Uh, Rabbi David Feinsilber of the Jewish Community of Greater Stowe. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Stowe has been busy in our community yeah. today. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so well, let's, let's go with that. For now, we'll, um, Representative Jim Batista, will you check with, with the coalition? Um, and see if that will be okay. They, they, they had accepted this language. Well, exactly. Excuse me. She needs to check with her yep. coalition. Okay. Is that the case? I'm sorry, but just to understand the process, is that the case with any okay. change to this language or just specifically to that? To that language right there. I, mean, that's one I really like their approval. They have worked for two very long years uh -huh. on this, so they've been, been the, the ones that have really brought this forward. Are also have expressed their sensitivity. They've been send, she's been sending the anti Semitic materials, so she's been very clear that, that um, it belongs in the conversation. We just want to make sure it doesn't tilt the other conversation. If I may, as I listen to you speak, you used many words that sounded really helpful, but aren't there. Now, I understand there has to be an economy of language, but when you talked about underrepresented, there are a number of words that you, that, um, that, that you referenced that describe what non-dominant means that maybe a little bit of explanation would be helpful there. Mm. I, I found it really helpful to listen to you. I didn't get that from reading this. <laughs> yeah, I think that it does seem like the, the this is a core definition to this bill that I think it does need to go go back and, and forth as much as, as necessary and this input's really appreciated. Um, but it is, the, this bill speaks to um, realities that have happened in, the in, in, in public education over a long time and also um, it speaks to things like hazing and bullying. Yeah. But at its core, it is a bill that creates a working group, but also creates a working group that will hopefully ha help a standard to be adopted, a standard which will you know, reinforce more equitable educational practices in the longer term in our schools. And so I think that not the what I think Dylan, the representative from Batista, is um, is talking about the fact that we want we're really trying to acknowledge that. Well, one of the testimony we heard is about windows and doors and mirrors being so important for for young students to be able to see themselves reflected in the curriculum mm -hmm. that, and mm -hmm. to be able to also be able to look past our you know beautiful but sometimes isolated hillside pockets in Vermont and to see a broader world in which they they might fit in a different context in which they do right in Addison or Lamoille or Wyndham County wherever it is and so anyway I just wanted to mention that just mm -hmm. as that's sort of the kind because I think it's really easy to pivot to a conversation where we are talking about persecution and hazing and bullying at the foremost but just to kind of bring it back to that not that those things aren't fully important but that the real core of this bill is really closely adjacent to those things but also kind of at its fundamental about something very subtly different. And, mm. and so mm. I don't pretend to have an easy answer about it, but you can go down a route where, where you're looking more at some of the realities of persecution in schools, and they're very symptomatic of what we're talking about, but they're also just next to what we're talking about. So it's, it's a complicated It absolutely is. Parse. You're right. But just a comment. Right. Right. I agree. And, and in fact, if one word makes one group feel like, uh-oh, there might be another word that makes another group feel like, uh-oh. So I'm flagging that word from the Jewish perspective, but who knows what the rest of it. So I, I, I don't envy the position where I don't understand complexity. Yeah. Thank you. And again, we want to make sure that we can use this bill. 
So based upon the conversations earlier and figuring out um, what words would fit with the feedback of some of the, the coalition group and then some of the members of the Jewish community who were present this morning at our meetings, um, something that we came close to, or at least that I wrote down, which is a modification of some of the language we talked about earlier, would be hate symbols have in recent years appeared with disturbing frequency at schools, in public places, places of worship, farms, and... I actually think that's it. There's one other clause at the end. It's not places of, I'm just trying to get it straight here, but um, the notion being that we acknowledge these symbols exist. Each of these tie out to a citation of, of an event that has actually happened in Vermont, and so you're actually memorializing the findings at the start of the bill provide the context for why we are taking the subsequent action. So within that, you would, we would be providing those examples. And I know the word hate symbol might not convey its full meaning for everyone who reads it, um, but these are not defined terms. They are terms as a general, let's set the, the floor of what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there's any feedback on that. That sounds helpful. Um, yeah. The two rabbis are nodding. I will send that to Jim. Thank you. I do think that that is, that is missing. Do you mind my asking when? When are you hoping this will be voted on? We are. Our goal is to get this done before the end of the day. We want to get a, We want to get the fully uh, amended bill onto the calendar. And I also have to have the committee has to make a decision here. Dylan and I don't make it on our own. Of course. Of course. Just, it's the committee. Yes, just, just but when do bills have to be? Turned in by I, like if we, I think we have one they more will day. Hold, but it's usually about four thirty, so I, I'm I think we're gonna be able to get that. Um, but when's the deadline for bills? Isn't it like one more day for bills? No, with the, with the here, here's how here's how the, the structure will work. Uh, right now our bill was on the notice calendar for today. It was up for um, presentation tomorrow. Dylan is prepared to do that. However, we want to make changes. We want to actually do a replacement am amendment. We want to do a strike all and put these changes in so we're not just trying to amend it in little pieces. We'd like to put it, you know, strike the whole bill, put in that other language, put in these changes, then it goes through as a complete one document, which is much easier to follow than the going back and forth. It makes people crazy. Mm -hmm. And that's not good. So, um, we would do that. We want to get it into the calendar tonight so that tomorrow when people come on the floor and the bill is being presented, the whole new bill is, is on the floor. And this will also be an opportunity for our other members who are not here to be able to vote. <laughs> so you're communicating with Jim right now, correct? Yes, he's going to fold in uh, language. I just sent it to him. Okay, thank you. He's getting his mileage in. Yeah, <laughs> he is. He's going back and forth between us and the Senate. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. much. Thank, thank you. you. Why don't, thank why don't, you. Would you like to testify mm -hmm. on this? Thank you. I, we, but I, I don't. We'd very much like to hear from both. I mean, you can sit next. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, come up. I mean, whatever. You, whatever. Yeah, so I'll be brief. Join us. Um, I'll be as brief as I can because we've been through a lot. <laughs> Thank you. We, we appreciate your input. So, so for the record. My name is um, Rabbi David Edelson. I'm the rabbi at Temple Sinai, which is a progressive reform community in South Burlington. And I, as, as Rabbi Amy um, Small said, we strongly support the motivation of this bill, the movement of this bill, Obviously, there are tremendous issues that need to be addressed in our education system. So the first thing I want to say is we are for the bill. 
So the problem is, um, and I'll, I'll give a little personal anecdote in a minute, but the problem is often anti-Semitism operates by making anti-Semitism invisible. That's one of the ways, there's ways systemic racism operates, there's ways systemic anti-Semitism <laughs> operates, and denying that it exists and naming it is one of the ways that it operates. And so one of the ra reasons I think we feel, and I understand as Amy said, that the limitations, and we, want, we don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good, um, but uh, leaving that out, leaving that word out can be actually participating in the systems that make it invisible. And the reason people feel it's like not naming racism would be if you were doing this bill and it never said the word racism, it would feel like you weren't, you were participating in the racism you're trying to fight against. So I, I did want to start by saying that's the concern if I could articulate it that way. Um, and I would add Islamophobia to that. They will operate very different ways in systemic uh, ways, but they, they share the tendency to try to say that they don't actually exist. And that's, that invisibility is part of the problem. Which leads me to um, when I met with my um, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders after Pittsburgh. Um, one of the things, I mean, we had a gathering as well, and it was very supportive, and it felt very great. But then I met with the kids uh, in Hebrew school. Um, and what they said almost to a person was that, yeah, that happened, and no one mentioned it in our school. And when we asked the teachers, they said, we're not supposed to talk about that. Um, and they said, and, and I said, well, how'd that make you feel? And they're like, well, we felt really invisible, and we felt like what we were going through didn't exist to other people. And these were fourth, fifth, and sixth graders in Vermont schools now, not some other time. So I think that invisibility is something that I think you need to be aware of. One of the issues with uh, anti-Semitism, since I'm a rabbi, I'll speak to that uh, specifically, um, uh, is that a partic Jews that don't wear yarmulkes or paraphernalia aren't eminently visible. And so it is very easy to hide what's happening there, which it isn't always in other minority groups, of course. It's, it's quite visible. I went to public schools in Georgia during forced integration of the schools in South Georgia um, with armed police, with forced busing. I was regularly beaten up for being Jewish. I was regularly bullied and punched. I wouldn't go far as beaten up, but similar things for being gay. I'm an openly gay man and was in high school. So, and we had access through our doors. We, had, uh, we experienced a tremendous amount of anti-Semitism growing up. And yet I would never try to say that what we experienced compared to what the African Americans were experiencing in the school system. So I think it, we get into real trouble when we try to compare these things, like you said. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I, I appreciated what you said, but I remembered when I was in college at William & Mary, another southern school, and they had exams on Yom Kippur, or my professor did, and I went and I said, look, it's Yom Kippur, can I take it before, can I take it after? She says, no, you can't. So I was in the Hillel, so I went to the president of the university who said, well, if we do it for you, we'll have to do it for Hindus. And he used a similar argument. And what my answer was there is that, well, that you should, right? Because if they have a holiday, like, that's, that's okay, right? So I think the issue here is what's happening right now, um, which is more along the lines of Islamophobia and, and um, anti-Semitism and racism and homophobia and transphobia. <laughs> But I also think it's important that when this work group is formed, that there's language in the bill that, that shows them the roadmap that these things are included, right? So when they're developing the standards you're speaking of and they're developing the curricula you're speaking of, that there's enough language in here that such issues as, these, as Islamophobia and anti-Semitism would need to be addressed. So one of the concerns that I have in the understandably trying not to go into certain areas that just raise a lot of red flags, um, is that I'm, I, would want to, I would want you to feel, and honestly, in your hearts, that this language would do that, if that makes sense to you. That this language would mean that the work group would have to wrestle with anti-Semitism. Um, now, obviously, Judaism, Jews are uh, sometimes difficult to define. So there's totally atheistic Jews that are cultural Jews. There's totally religious Jews that, you know, we have, we have a wide gamut. I have um, African-American Jews in my congregation. We are all, we're all different colors. So we fit in between, like we're a Venn diagram of identities. And it makes the language difficult, and I recognize that. Um, that being said, they are 
they're, they are experiencing anti-Semitism in a variety of forms. One of those forms is to deny that it exists. Another form Amy brought up in this dominant language is that, well, the Jews are actually the most dominant group in the world, which is regularly trafficked to this day in this country. And sadly, there is anti-Semitism in communities of color. There's racism in communities of faith. Like, not, we're all, there's enough blame to go around. There's enough, uh, you know, there's enough... Uh, I don't want to say hatred, but certainly misunderstanding and a lack of understanding to go around. Um, but that being said, it's important that the work group from the Vermont legislature make it clear that people would need to work on those issues as well. If somebody, um, I've heard stories of you know kids going to school with a yarmulke on and having their yarmulke yanked off. After Pittsburgh, I had students that decided they would go to school with a yarmulke on, even though that's never been their thing because they felt like, I need to do this. And what they experienced was not good at all. I know other peop other stories of people that, you know, that are throwing money at I had this happen when I was a kid, so it breaks my heart. Throwing money at you and going, We know you love money, we know you love money, that sort of thing, like in the lunchroom every day. It's it's not fun. And it's not minor and it's not subtle, right? Like some things are subtle. Some of this is not subtle. And so um, I just think it's particularly important that uh, I, I think it's particularly important that the word anti-Semitism um, find its way, if not into the bill, into the notes on the bill, into some guidance for the work committee. I don't know what those parameters are, but leaving it out is actually participating in the very problem. And so I, I know I'm speaking strongly. Uh, I hope I made it really, I mean, I, I tick a lot of minority boxes as it happens, and I, su I very strongly support what you've been doing and support getting the bill out, support get, not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. But I fear that if that word is not in there somewhere, somehow, that it is really easy to overlook it. And so uh, I would just end very quickly, so um, David has a chance, by saying, uh, for those of you that don't know, Jews all over the world read the same part of our Torah, our sacred book, each week. So no matter where you are, you're reading the same thing. This week, one of the lines in our text is, uh, you shall not oppress the stranger because you were strangers in Egypt and you know the heart of the oppressed. So uh, this bill is completely fitting in our tradition and our values and our ethics. Um, we just want to be included in it um, for reasons that I think Amy very said very articulately. So I thank you for that opportunity. I'll see if there's questions. Well, one, one thing I would say that I think sometimes gets lost in this is this work group will be uh, subject to open meeting law, which means their meetings will be <coughs> open, and you will be able to ask to provide testimony to the group. Okay. I think that the experiences that you have in even curriculum development about, <coughs> about what you're doing in your Hebrew schools um, would be very helpful to the group as well. So. Um, I, I would say that you know you, you can go to these meetings if if there isn't someone who's <coughs> Jewish on the committee on the commission, either through the appointment of, of the committee of the of the um, of the group, the working group. Um, there's also the opportunity for uh, the, a teacher representative to be Jewish. There's an opportunity for someone from the school boards association, from the superintendents. There are other groups there that would be able to have the opportunity to bring in a Jewish voice. We're struggling a little bit with a, 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 an Islamic voice because I haven't been able to speak to anybody. Um, but I'm hoping that, that somehow we can we can we can include in the language somewhere that, that this can can be. I appreciate that. I, I, we had a meeting with the state police that where there's an on, on, on anti-bias policing, right? There's that committee, and it didn't occur to them to ask a Jewish representative on that group at all. So I guess what I would just say, and that, I don't think that was a deliberate oversight. It's part of what we're talking about. Anti-Semitism can feel invisible. And especially, and I'll say this being Southern, in New England, there's a sense of self-congratulation that that's not who we are. But that's not my experience here either. So I, what you're sp saying speaks to me, but I just think it's really necessary to make sure that is followed through on, if that makes sense. So thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, forgive me. I didn't mean to interrupt. But, uh, no, that's okay. Yes. Yeah, me too. I, I have to feed my meter in a minute, but I, when I leave, it's only to do that I'll be back. Um, <laughs> I do want to say that um, when you mention having a Jewish representative of one of these other groups, 
I don't think that does it. No. Um, because they don't live our lives. Mm -hmm. They're not the ones who are hearing the stories from the children, from the parents, from my meeting with a person who's a nurse at the hospital. That's They're awesome. not the ones who are hearing these stories and understand the subtleties, the hiddennesses, and the sensitivities that would need to be brought to bear. And so while that seems like a good idea, if, if I may, I would like to suggest that there be very specifically chosen Jewish representatives, um, if not us, but other, we, we certainly can and would be happy to, but also other um, official representatives of, the, of our community and the Muslim community. And Amy speaks there my mind on that. Eight, there are eight. <laughs> there are members, uh, and, and we have decided that the legislature does not be, want to be choosing those people. So we are asking the coalition, and, and, and you could certainly lobby the coalition okay. to have some a representation. But I, I wanted to make sure that you have an opportunity. And, and um, Representative James, did you have a question for somebody? Uh, no. And, and just a second, I just wanted to see um, Emily Rosenbaum. Did you want to speak at all about some of your experiences, or do you have to go? If I can minutes? speak, if I can go for five minutes, I have one child. Yeah, if I can go for five so minutes. Back. Yes. No, now, now. I have oh, to leave. Yeah. So part, sorry, of, I will be there. <laughs> part of why I have to leave is because one of my children is no longer in the Vermont public schools due to the intense anti-Semitism he experienced. And Emily Rosenbaum, I'm sorry. Um, and so his carpool drops him in Waterbury every day because we have had to pull him out of the public schools. Um, there, I, I do not have a tremendous amount of time because I have another child with a strep throat. Um, but I do want to say that um, I am the president of the Jewish community of Greater Stowe. Um, I have been tremendously moved by the conversations I've had with educators in our supervisory union. They are desperate for help from the state. They are desperate for guidance and funds to help address some of these issues. So this bill is tremendously important. Um, and they talk to me all the time about it, like, can you get us some help? Um, and part of what we're dealing with in our community, we've had three different instances of swastikas on school grounds since the summer. We have had two different instances that my family alone has experienced, one yesterday, of people laughing about Mein Kampf, which if you don't know what that is, it's Hitler's biography that sets out the plan for the destruction of the Jewish people in the schools. Yeah. And those are only the ones my family has witnessed. We have, um, again, the, the coins being thrown in the cafeteria to pick them up. Jews can't play basketball. The, the scarring that happens is not just from the, those things happening. It's from not being able to stand up for other targeted minorities because you're so afraid of being targeted yourself. It's forming an identity when the anti-Semitism is sort of erased because we've had educators in the supervisory union say, wait, can we say anti-Semitism? And that's part of the problem with some of the language we're talking about here. It keeps skirting anti-Semitism. Wait, can we call swastikas anti-Semitic? I hope so. Um, and so the, it, is, it is a very difficult situation. And there's a, that erasure of anti-Semitism is, is part of it. And so um, when we talk about what our children are going through, the most heartbreaking thing for me, and, and Rabbi David will talk more about it, I think, is when our youth tell us they try to hide being Jewish. Because they are forming their lifetime identity. And everyone in this room knows that the biggest protection you can have if you are targeted is feeling part of your group and feeling supported by your group. And when they are trying to hide it or assimilate because they are afraid, that is tragic to me. Um, and so that, that if you have any questions, please feel free to give them to me now before I go deal with carpool, strep throat, and a 10-year-old. You mentioned something about a flag, too, because it's at your school. Flags. Oh, yeah. yeah. They're like flags. Mm -hmm. um, we, we did have some Gadsden flags that were hung outside of our school. 
um, from what I understand, as you probably know, those students did not mean them to be hurtful. But when they were told they were being viewed as anti-Semitic and racist, they hung them out the next day anyway. And they were within their rights, I guess. But the question is, don't we want our youth, when they hear that something is being perceived that way, to go, oh, and take them down, and not continue to wear the t-shirt, and not continue to hang the flags. And it, the heartbreaking thing to me was the parents of our very few black students in our school who came to find me afterwards to thank me for saying something, because at least I felt I could say something. They didn't even feel they could say anything. And those are flags that were waved while people were shouting, Jews will not replace us. So let's be clear, those flags have taken on some new meaning. But flags are sticky, you know? They have symbolism and they're sticky because they can mean one thing and then mean another and, and you can, it, it, they, it just moves. So, you know, my, I understand the reason to just talk about symbols of hate because it's, they are, symbols always move. I have a doctorate in literature, so I can say that. <laughs> um, but it's just, it's very hard to see a laundry list of people who are having issues in our schools and have no place in the bill that specifically mentions the anti-Semitism. Any questions for me? How do we get in contact? Um, I, I believe you have, I've sent you my JCOGS email address, correct? Yes. I'm very specific to use my JCOGS email address for JCOGS business. Um, but I can give you my cell phone number Please. if you'd like. Just, uh, mm -hmm. I don't want it going in the record, though. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, catch you as you will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I just prefer not to have my phone number public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But my email address um, is emily.rosenbaum at jcogs.org. Anything else? Good luck Thank with you. the children. Thank <laughs> you. You guys do amazing work, and I want to apologize for all the exhaustion you have experienced earlier today. <laughs> Thank you. And what you have in store for yourself today. Mm -hmm. We have a strep test I later today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, please. You've been here a long time, and as I remember, you were uh, on the road at midnight last night. I was. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Rabbi David Feinsilver of the Jewish Community of Greater Stowe, and also a parent of three young ones in the Morrisville system, live in Morrisville. And, um, I am representing, as uh, the rabbi of Jacobs, uh, members who span over 15 towns. We're from Montgomery uh, up north down to Warren Waitsfield, and everywhere in between in east and west. So. Um, you know, we're, we're a diverse group. Uh, thank you for letting me testify to wear a tie. I feel a little out of place. Um, and what's remarkable, and what you're hearing today, is three rabbis coming up here and giving you all the same information. And I'd like you to take that in, right? Uh, we, there's a, there's a well-known <laughs> Jewish phrase, two Jews, three opinions, uh, and it's very true, and yet we can all come here and say to you, we value this bill greatly, we are all deeply invested in work uh, across uh, working with minority groups, targeted groups, we're all doing a lot of work on this. Uh, from LGBTQ to folks with disabilities to refugees, uh, uh, racism work. Um, I'm helping to lead a Stowe Morrisville coalition uh, working on uh, racism and anti Semitism and other isms in our catchment area. Um, and so, you know, we're all for let's go and let's do this and let's get this to the floor. Um, what you're also hearing is that we want the word anti-Semitism included uh, uh, in this bill. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of reasons for that. There is uh, the uh, systemic history of anti-Semitism in, uh, in Vermont. 
that is not talked about, but you can Google it, uh, and uh, there are articles written on it, um, including um, dozens of Gentiles-only signs uh, in fairly recent uh, history. Um, as a as a parent, uh, what what I see in the schools is a very uh, Christian dominant society. Um, my kids uh, coming to school before Christmas uh, and uh, the the day before they go on the uh, winter break is uh, they're showing a movie and it's Polar Express. And you can either go to this movie and watch how wonderful it is to believe in Santa Claus, or you can sit alone in the office if your parents happen to uh, know that Polar Express is being shown and advocating for your kid to not join in that film. Uh, so I think there's a lot that's coming out of just simple uh, lack of knowledge, um, you know, so, <clears throat> and that's, that's important. But there's also a lot that's just blatant anti-Semitism. Uh, there are, you, you've heard uh, <laughs> over a dozen <laughs> examples at this point. You've heard of the multiple swastikas uh, in our uh, Lamoille um, Union. Um, you've heard of the closeted uh, Jewish students in middle school and high school who won't let their friends know that they are uh, actually Jewish. Uh, one student uh, told me that uh, they were coming up to a door at, uh, in their school, a group of kids in it, the, the, she wanted to enter into the room. They said, you can't go in there, you're Jewish. Um, pennies thrown on the floor. Um, and what we're hearing from the educators, from the administrators who we're working closely with, uh, and uh, the students is that, how do we name this problem? simple word for it, anti-Semitism. As Emily said earlier, they wouldn't call a swastika anti-Semitic. If my kids who are growing up in these schools can't put a name to it, then they're lost. I love that image, I think you use it, of, of putting up mirrors, right? Mirrors, uh, let's reflect who is in our communities, right? And what they're experiencing, and this is what's happening right now. Um, Anti-Semitism works very differently than all of these other isms. Um, we, we're not a, we can't be pigeonholed as a people, we're not all religious, uh, we're not all secular, we're not all cultural Jews, um, um, we, we span multiple ethnicities across the world from India to the Middle East to Eastern Europe to North Africa to North America and beyond, right, we're on all continents, uh, and uh, and when we, yet we're talking today about what it's like to be a rural Jew, right, and to identify in that way. And this would be a different conversation in New York, right? This would be a different conversation in Boston. And there's anti Semitism there, right? But rural Judaism, uh, there's a, a lack of knowledge, there's a lack of, there's, there's a, we can't even, we can't even 
there are people who don't know Jews, have never met Jews, don't even know what anti-Semitism is, that a swastika's, what, what is a swastika's history? I mean, it's really just basic and fundamental. Uh, and so, and then here we are talking about whether to include this word anti-Semitism and um, there's something about even asking that question, can we include it or not, but that, that there's something sticky about that too. Um, yeah. We're naming, we're naming in the bill. Where is this? Um, there's a paragraph, there's a paragraph four in the findings. Um, Hold up. Um, we're naming LGBTQI, uh, we're naming disability, we're naming uh, racism, all of these, all of these issues, um, and my suggestion is that we add, is it possible to pull it up? Um, um, can, you, can you do that? Yeah, let's see. Yeah. 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 Um, then there's that. It's all even numbers, two, four, six, eight, ten. <laughs> <laughs> that would be big. So, number four in the findings, the, the harassment of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. Uh, it's in, it's in uh, 2.1. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm we'll just... go back to the committee. Back to the committee. Yeah, there it is. Wow. Okay. Queer, questioning, intersex, asexual, and non-binary communities. This one? Yeah. yeah. Other students of color, students with disabilities, and the lack of understanding of people in power about the magnitude of this systemic impacts of harassment and bias uh, damage the whole community. Um, Further down. There it is. There it is. Yeah. Uh, yep, right there. So my suggestion, I think it's a pretty simple one, is to add uh, religious bias, um, the harassment of uh, the har harassment based on religious bias. Uh, and then in brackets, including Jewish and Muslim uh, students, add an etc. in there. Uh, you've named the the folks who are mainly being targeted, just like all the, just like this list that is right here in the bill. Uh, but you've also included it to other religious minorities who might, uh, uh, who might and are experiencing significant harassment. That's my ask. We do have another draft. Yep. I was hoping that our lawyer would be here. Yes, yes. He's hiding. <laughs> 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 hiding him over here. Yeah. <laughs> He's hiding over there where it says reps reserved for st st staff with presence. Um, okay, we, we, we have new language um, that we can go through. Is it, is it, uh, do we have an electronic? Uh, I'm not sure. Jim, this is the 12 page version that you handed me a paper copy of. Sharon has it. Sharon has it. Is it the one? Right there. Yeah. 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 3.1, okay. 3.1. And, and so I don't yet see it, so I just want to confirm. Kate, you have that paper copy, does it say? Uh, it says 3.1. That's 3.1. Okay. Why don't you just refresh and see if it's there. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um, and I, you know, I, I, I should have not posted it. Yeah, yeah, that one? Yeah, that one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Then I'll just be a minute. Okay. Thank you. So, um, I think what I will do is um, now is, is have um, Jim sit here and go through the bill and this will be an opportunity to see where we are and, and yes and why don't you just see what we're doing first sure absolutely okay? we've been talking over the weekend <laughs> no friend so um, so jim will you join us oh sure is that okay and go through so i'm going to have him go through this bill let's see where the language is here and then take a look. And again, I also want to uh, reiterate the not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good, that there is an op another opportunity to address this in the Senate. Um, since we haven't, I'm hoping we can get this finalized today. I'm sorry that I don't see Amanda in the room. Do we know where she is? Um, she could not get childcare. Oh. Um, but I checked, in quickly. <laughs> I checked in quickly. I checked in quickly and she broke this is language that um, Dylan and I have been in discussion with with a variety of people. We've come up with some language. And um, okay. we'll see if this is working. <coughs> and it may not be. It may not be what you want, but it's where, where we are right now. Wow. Yes, yeah, but Technology. I know. Amazing. Go to Bill's. Mm -hmm. It's right there. Yay, hey, there it is. It was there. No, I think that was it. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we so had you helping me. <laughs> 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 oh, I'm sorry. 3.1. Yes. Yeah. There you go. All right. So the changes from the uh, from the bill that we passed out of committee um, are in black. The changes that we're looking at right now are in yellow. Yep. Okay. okay, so for the record, uh, Jim Damore, Vice Council, we're going through a proposed mm -hmm. amendment to your report uh, on the Committee of Education on H3. And as Chair Webb mentioned, the changes from your report are in yellow. Uh, the first change is on page 2, um, line 19, with a new finding, which reads, according to the U.S. Department of Justice report, on hate crimes in Vermont in 2017, 51% of hate crimes were based on a motivation involving racial bias, 23% of hate crimes were based on a motivation involving sexual orientation bias, 17% of hate crimes uh, were based on a motivation involving religious bias, and 9% of hate crimes were based on a motivation involving <coughs> disability bias. Um, another new finding is on line four, which reads, hate, hate symbols have in recent years appeared with disturbing frequency at schools and public spaces, places, places of worship, farms, and places of business. And then uh, six, this was a finding you already had, uh, but it's been uh, revised. So now it reads, the harassment of marginalized groups and the lack of understanding of people in power what the magnitude of the systemic impacts of harassment by it damages the whole community. Then on, on the definition of ethnic groups on line 11, this is now broken into two parts. The first part was the same as before, uh, talking about non-dominant racial and ethnic groups with various um, uh, examples of, of that. And then second, uh, on line 16, and minorities that have been historically subject to persecution or genocide. And that is not modified by the non-dominant uh, uh, word. Um, and then on page four, the, uh, the working group has increased to 18 members from 17. And the uh, additional member on page five, line three, 
is the executive director of the Vermont Human Rights Commission, or this me. Uh, and then we have a uh, typographical error uh, from before. So on line 17 on page 7, uh, it says the working group may recommend. It said to say for that was just a uh, typographical error, so it's been corrected. Um, and then lastly, in terms of reporting, so this is now section two of the bill, where we're now um, having the state board report various metrics by um, by group. So now we are including, among other other groups, uh, uh, religious groups. That's it. Okay. Let's go back to um, page two. And the first thing that we have then is number four, which is includes the data from the U.S. Department of Justice. This is the thing that identifies hate crimes and who was affected. Committee, are we okay with that? Not into our participants here. This is acceptable to include this data. So, committee, everybody's good with including that. Okay, check. Yay. Okay. Yes. Yes. Representative. Make sure that they are too. I I I did look over and I see a nod. Thank you though to make sure that we get data. Facts are important. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Here's one. Number five. Here's one. Hate symbols have, in recent years, appeared with disturbing frequency at schools and public place spaces, places of worship, farms, and places of business. This is where the discussion came in as to whether we should include swastika. And we had a lot of conversation about that in our small group. Wouldn't farms be considered, I mean, why are we singling off farms? Why don't we just have places of business? Mm -hmm. it seems weird to have farms there. I don't know. Representative mm -hmm. Batista. Uh, this is referencing a report in particular. Yeah. And uh, Jim, you you have each of these corresponds to a news story. Is that correct? I don't know about this one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So so we had pulled a number of news stories, so we could double check that. Um, but each of them would correspond. I'll I'll just pull up. I might be able to speak to that. There's often uh, symbols of hate on the white coated hay bales yeah. and things like that on That's the sides of grow houses. So right. because know. they're so large, as you drive down the road. So okay. I think. That's and what if you remember the Take Back Vermont. Sure. Yes. Uh, that was common on and barns. Yeah. Yeah. Representative one James. Sure. Representative James, do you have something? No. Yeah. Uh, just a minute. Yeah. Just, I guess, just following up on Serena's possible concern that, I mean, you're elaborating is helping me, but that it seemed like we were singling out. The other, the other places listed are um, public spaces all over Vermont, um, where anybody, I guess, could show up and hang something offensive or horrible, um, whereas a farm almost seems like you're targeting farmers. And is that what we're intending to do? And is that accurate? Uh, place is a business, a farm is a business. I think that if there are concerns there that would concern the committee, places of business would tend to catch a farm. I'm not sure if there's other thoughts on that, but... Is that looking, looking to my um, guidance team here, my three rabbis and my, <laughs> my buddy over here? <laughs> yeah. Assistant okay. rabbi over here. Yes, yeah. yes. Assistant <laughs> 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 yes. Well, I would say that I, I've lived in Vermont for yes. a little more than three years, and it's quite noticeable how Vermont's culture is unique to Vermont, including farms. And given that this has happened to farms, and this is specific to the way it's being expressed in Vermont, that felt helpful to me. Yeah, I'm also thinking about migrants, migrant workers. Yeah. No, I was just saying uh, migrant workers, and I think I do remember the, the article, like the news yeah. article that they covered them. You know, yeah. Yeah. Well. So, I mean, I'm just concerned because I think it might imply that farmers are more uh, 
you know, it, it ties farmers to farms, and I, I don't think that's fair or accurate. I mean, well, I, it's, it's the symbols are, are showing up on farms. It's not farmers are placing them. Like, a lot? Well, yeah. well, I think well, it's, it's, it's appearing. It's appearing mm -hmm. on hay bales. Yes, but they're appearing, appearing on sides of buildings. And Go ahead. So yeah. let me just, who, who wants to that's keep right. farm in there? Are we quoting a story? I'm is trying that what that to. Well, <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 This is where we're, we're going to get ourselves really tangled, everybody. Um, that's a reason. Quagmire. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Are you? I just got to look at this. Like, which one of these things is not like the other test? And everything else on that list is pretty general. And farm is pretty specific. I would say that if it's captured credibly by pick places of business, it it seems it seems like once you list farms, yeah. Yeah. there's a whole lot of That's things right. at that kind of trophic level you're not listing. Yeah. I would agree with that. Yes, Rabbi. I don't mean to take it. Um, having thought about it after what I just said and conferred, uh, you want if if it's too controversial and it's too much of a red flag, let's lose farms. Um, there are places where I think, for my purposes and the purposes of the representatives of the Jewish community, we were more concerned about in language being included. This one we don't own. It's okay if it's not there from my perspective. So for for hate, all of these controversies. Back to hate symbols. Is hate symbols is that going to be enough? Excuse me, Rabbi. I, I you had want to say something? Add something? Um, I just know that I have limited time. Yes. I, in terms of the additions, I have no problems with any of them. So I'm, I'm giving my nod to all of them. Um, we still haven't addressed adding in anti-Semitism, and that seems like a larger question. Right. So, I mean, can we, is it possible to talk about that and then move on to going through all these? These, yes. uh, said a different way, these seem pretty benign to me. Um, so I think we're saying the same thing. Okay, yeah. so the hate symbols, just leaving it hate symbols, you're okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Let's get, so, should we move on to we'll the next question? Does everybody, you, every, everyone else, let me just take with my committee. I just want to go through with this. You're okay with that? We're removing farms? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, yes. 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 So not to complicate things, but well, why farms <laughs> stuck, out, stuck out to me, and now I get to apply to the place of business. This is not saying whether they are uh, victims of Hate symbols or creators of hate symbols? Where they perform. Right. But I guess it's sort of vague. Yeah. All right. Final words. They're appearing there. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with removing farms. Let's remove farms. <coughs> yes, capture okay. my business. And then I won't say anything. Yeah. I'm going to keep, I've, I've said I'm going to keep breathing. I'm going to tell myself the same thing. Yeah. Okay. So in terms of committee, you know what? I, I think I, I will stop and we will get to this issue because I know that you have limited time. There are some reasons that we've heard not to include anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. One of the questions, concerns that we heard is when we say anti-Semitism, that that is tied to Palestine and Israel. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things that we've heard, and we do not want to be getting waged in on that factor. Is that your experience? Never. It's an issue. What's that? You, you, can, you can separate that. Um, Representative Jim Batista, did you have more from the coalition on that concern? No, just there uh, has been discussion about um, how words could be or have been codified in other states, um, and that some have questioned uh, whether the use of anti-Semitism as a legal term in other states is being used to talk about um, different either groups of people or different sovereignties. I'm not an expert in that area, so I'm not aware of that. And I, I have not done legal research on use of anti-Semitism within other uh, state laws or national laws. I'm just not aware. I've never heard that. Have you ever heard that? No. Because um, we do not want to be getting into that political yeah. discussion. Right. That's we're trying to set up a group. Certainly Jews and, and yeah. Hamas are, you know, whatever, but not anti-Semitism. And then 
could we solicit the opinion of somebody around the table who just seems to be uh, wanting to interject? Who is that? Uh, she's now engaged with. Oh. Yeah. Um, I'd like to first get back to the rabbis and um, see if you could huddle and suggest language for us. See if that could work. If you could suggest language that we would add to the findings. Related. Do you have? Oh, you've got it. Well, I'm not going to do that again. One yeah. option here is says hate symbols have in recent years. You could say hate symbols, comma, including anti-Semitic symbols, or or primarily anti-Semitic symbols. So you could just put it right there. Put it in there. Yeah. It, uh, I'm, not, I, I'm not going to speak real life. I'm guessing that's not getting to where you would like us to go. Well, it's more, it's, it's more than symbols, right? So, I mean, you heard, you heard lots of stories about how it's more than just symbols. Can we focus in? I, as an editor who spends a lot of time working with 10, 12, 18 people review boards, I, I, I'm reluctant to even say anything. I know you guys have been working on this language for a couple of years. That's why I'm being so quiet. Um, but could we, could we not, uh, to try to get to a solution, key in on, um, I'm on page three, uh, the new definition of ethnic groups, um, code of B. Um, would that be a place to get to, to get to our solution in a very kind of succinct way? It, could it be something, Dylan, I'm really looking to you here, like um, uh, minorities that have been historically subject to discrimination, harassment, persecution, or genocide based on religion, Can we do for comma, example? you know, add, make a little list there, right in that specific section, and that could be a place also to insert the word anti-Semitism. I'm looking at that one specific section that seems like it could be expanded to include a broader definition, and then we don't really need to go anywhere else. So can you can you formulate that sentence? Yeah. Um, so maybe it could be a real a broader thing. So minorities that have been historically subject to harassment, comma, discrimination, comma, persecution or genocide based on religion, comma. Um, now I've lost my list. Um, religion, comma. Gender, you know, we could go back and get get a good <coughs> list. Can we just say and then you could say this might include, you know, somewhere I, I, after religion, you could put anti-Semitism, comma, Islamophobia, comma. I also want to remind folks that there's another opportunity in the Senate to address this. There's another <coughs> opportunity to address this. My goal is to get this onto the floor tomorrow and move to the Senate and to get the action on this work group going. It's possible that we aren't going to have enough time to get that language <coughs> together unless you can huddle, that the three of you, four of you can huddle, give us some language um, that, that we can accept um, or, or work with Jim and, and Dylan. Um, we, we just, we're, we have a time limit here. Madam Speaker, not to uh, prolong people's suspense, but <coughs> I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Madam Speaker, thank you. 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 Madam Speaker, Going into that break, I would just mention I, I'm interested in whether an addition on page 8, line 10 or 11 would make sense. So maybe if people are talking about that, I, maybe this is just where it says challenge, and then we've got our list of, of behaviors, and I'm just thinking that challenging <coughs> anti Semitic or Islamophobic behaviors could fit in that list. I know it makes it a longer list, and that. Uh, so page eight of the draft is voted out of the committee, and so I'm sorry, this may not be what we've got oh, up here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so maybe it's a slightly different line. I think it's still page eight. Uh, 
There's a nine line three. Yes, yeah, so shall yeah nine channel nine nine, nine. nine. okay. Channel sorry, yeah, it moved. Six, yeah, we have enough language. Nine, 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 three. There we go. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, page nine, line three. So I'm just curious if that might be a place where uh, language mm -hmm. anti-Semitic could be included in there, because that to me is kind of nice. where the rubber hits the road yeah. in terms of these standards. And so that actually seems to me even in some ways a little more core than the language about you know who is included, and that that could be a little more. Anyway, that's it. That's, yeah. the, that's the spot we might look at. I was just wondering. Mm -hmm. about. It does get to the core. Right. Uh, let's take a break. Yes, please. <coughs> what are we doing? So, Yes, I am. Right now, we have a choice to continue to nuke this language to death. Not that I have an opinion on that. <laughs> Not much. <laughs> or get it to a point that it's acceptable and grease a path for the Senate to, to take up the differences, which I'm willing to do. This would mean that some of the, the things that we're not able to quite get right um, be an opportunity for the coalition and the Jewish community to work together in language that they can both live with. We're out of time for that. This is the beauty of having another body that can address this. So my recommendation is we make some slight changes here, and we leave room for the Senate to have something to do. <laughs> and, and I am quite sure that as soon as H3 is on their calendar, that their room will be full. Um, and we know that the process, there's a, there is another process. So there are a couple of um, changes that we have looked at. One was on page nine. Are we in that 3.1? Right? We're in right, 3.1. Okay. On page nine, I am reluctant to use the word religion, but we can talk about that. On D, so on C, there was a recommendation to include religion or socioeconomic status. And then under D, there was a recommendation to include religion. I am going to suggest that what we do is under D, it says specify prohibited conduct as it relates to racism. These are, these are those biased terms, okay? Right. Racism, sexism, ableism, and other ethnic and social biases. We have defined ethnic groups that will include those that have been persecuted or subject to genocide. So that will roll them into that discussion. That would be a change that I would recommend, and the rest of it, I would, I would recommend to the committee that we make that change, we vote it out, and we do the good work tomorrow. Right now the clerk is waiting for us. And we grease the path to set it up for the Senate to have something to do. Um, it opens the door for people coming in with amendments to say that we're including that, which is, is a challenge, and I am concerned about it, um, because I don't want to vote that down on the floor. I want it to be taken up in the Senate. Right. I don't necessarily have that control. In terms of making that change in other ethnic and social biases, Jim, would that be, what do you, what's your thought on if we did that under D on page 9? Fine. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. The other question that came up was on page 3. There was a discomfort with the word on line 16, minorities, that have been historically subject to persecution. There's a possibility that we could just call it groups. <laughs> that as general as you can get. Mm -hmm. <coughs> oh, sure. Yeah. Or, yeah. Sure. That, that's, yeah. that's one way of doing it. Or, or populations. Populations. Yeah, we are wordsmithing, and, and this is what we're not good at. Well, groups is uh, fits well with the language in this definition, because I think groups means, and the first one says, 
non-dominant racial and ethnic groups. Yeah. So using groups in B would make sense. Would make sense. I think. Yeah. From so a drafting standpoint. Committee? Good with groups? Yes. yes. Anybody opposed? Good. Yeah, instead of minorities? Instead of minorities, yeah. I'm probably opposed. So that's all right. Yeah. And again, they can address this to the Senate, which they, I'm sure that they will. So we're, we're talking line 16, B. changing minorities to groups. To groups. And then we're talking about on page 9, under D, line 6, and other ethnic and social biases. Can you roll it up? Yep. Maybe people's? Are you on? Are you on page nine? Where are you? Oh, you're, you're on the other one. No, no, I'm talking about groups. D. Of groups. Oh, the groups. So you're back to groups. So well, group. it, it, it is, that does work. Though, yeah, it, yeah. So groups, groups worked and actually sort of worked into the language. So on um, line six, we add and other ethnic and social biases. I'm sorry, I don't know where the rabbis are. Does anybody know what happened to the rabbis? I don't know. I, I think they had to go. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Page nine. Sure, we're, we're, we're looking at line six on page nine. Ableism and other adding ethnic and. Okay. Okay. Good. Can I just say yeah. one thing? Yeah. Judaism isn't an ethnicity. Right, but it's defined in the, on ethnic groups. Okay. It's defined as um, the reason that I was thinking that that would work is because we have defined ethnic groups. And the rabbis were okay with that. They, they were, were okay. okay. With that. okay. They were uncomfortable with the term minorities. Okay. That's fine. Yeah, they're fine with it. Yeah, I mean, I think that they, they do, they are correct that we did do a list on line 14. I recognize that, and as soon as you do a list, we know what happens, right? Right, right. So they have something to say about that. Um, somehow, I just sort of missed that one. I don't know how we missed it, but we did. And so I think that they have an argument about why we should address that. That's what the Senate is for. Um, Representative Coopley wants to put short people. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll go for short people. <laughs> I would like that too. Being one who's discriminated against and made fun of. Yeah. So I just have to let Dylan know when I think of one of those. So that one, those are very quick. You can do those easily, correct? Correct. Uh, yeah. My question is this right now is an amendment from Rep. Jim Batista. Yes. And are we going to oh, put. That, that would be the next question. This could be an amendment offered by everybody named, we can't say by the Education Committee, we have to name who would want to be on this amendment that's addressing this. So I can either put it in as just Dylan's doing it, or I could put the names in who would be on, want to be on this uh, amendment. This is, again, as, as I said, this is a strike-all amendment, keeping it organized in one thing for the Senate to pick up for the press to pick up and they're not trying to deal with these piecemeal things, right? It's much more organized. Um, and it can be offered by who 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 would like to have their name on this? You would? Well, I, I guess we should explain the benefit of putting yeah. the uh, yeah. as much of the committee on as possible mm -hmm. as that's okay. seen by the floor I'm, as yeah. don't I'm, put on yeah. having this the committee support. Let me let me just take a straw vote. Who who so far is in support of the bill the way we just were talking about? I'm going for the bill. All right, so we have a straw vote that looks no. like we're going to come up with a little 11 0 vote. Um, I asked Dylan to come back. Excuse me? I asked Dylan to come back. Good, me too. Maybe he'll listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> Assessing options. No more options. <laughs> um, Madam Chair? Yes. I did uh, mention it, but uh, Representative Ansel noticed that ableist was spelled wrong. That what? Ableist to... was spelled wrong. Oh. And well, so, uh, ironically, that is what it was spelled like when she testified. I thought it was ableism. 
It's ableism is line six. I took it from her testimony, but yeah, that was yeah. how yeah. it might be wrong. So I can't find any place in any dictionary Google that Google spells it anything other than A B L E I S T. Okay. I can't find it anywhere spelled that way. Okay. Yeah. Like Wait, that's what it says. That's what I'm saying. That's the only way. A B E L I S T. Oh, two different lines. Right. Oh, do we have it two ways? It's correct yeah. on line six. six. Uh -huh. Ableism six. versus ableism. Three is wrong. That's what, uh, yeah. that's what our editors do, right? Yeah. <laughs> no slacking. No. <laughs> <laughs> She's retired. Hmm. These are like three of them. Yeah, I think. Yeah. That's definitely it. Yeah. I would like to get Dylan back here. Yeah. Yeah. That's making an assumption. I. Saw it and I was like, wow, that must be how it's spelled because it's so, so did I. Yeah, yeah. It's in the house. I, mean, yeah. I, thought, I had no idea. It's legislative spelling. Oh, I'm right. on line three. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. Judge okay. would be like, what is this? What does this mean? <laughs> clean that up. I don't even know what you guys are talking about. The problem, you have just two oh, English majors and minors in the house. I think I should go work on this because it took a few minutes to get all your names on it. So, should I work to go work on this? I'll come back. Yeah, so why don't you do that? Sure. Um, Um, I will. <laughs> yes, I'll be short. I spoke with one rabbi. Um, Okay. <laughs> He's a politician. <laughs> okay. Um, hi, I'm Jason Lorber. I'm uh, come here as a private citizen, and I'm a former member of this body. And it's great to see um, my old <laughs> folks that I've worked with, and kind yeah, of uh, <laughs> old and, folks. That's us. <laughs> I speak because I'm one, um, and um, and I so appreciate the work that this committee has done on such an important bill, um, and I just applaud this work because we need we need this bill. Uh, we need to address uh, the concerns, um, uh, particularly of racism, but also um, anti-ableism and the um, homophobia and. LGBT phobia and all that stuff. Um, and as someone who is Jewish and um, um, and in conference with, um, with my rabbi, um, uh, whom, who testified here, um, I want to share a couple thoughts, um, and I'll be very brief, um, that, you know, one of the that anti-Semitism is real, and um, and when I go to high holidays, uh, which for Jews that means Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah, the holiest holidays of the year, uh, we have armed guards there. So, uh, for those of you who go to Christmas Mass or to Easter Sunday um, services, Imagine if you not only had police there to keep you safe, but you felt the need to have that there. That is our reality that we face. Um, and certainly the, um, the massacre um, in Pittsburgh that happened just not, what, a month ago, two months ago, um, is fresh in our minds as are the swastikas at the high schools. Um, so it's very real. And um, I appreciate the work 
that you guys are doing in trying to please everyone <laughs> and move this bill forward. Um, and um, so I, I think I'll just leave it there and say thank you for the work that you've done. Um, and we need to continue to address all forms of bigotry. prohibited conduct as it relates to racism, sexism, ableism, and other social biases, and refers to a process that we said, and other ethnic and social biases, which would, it's addressed in terms of ethnic groups, would, it would cover, it would at least go back to that. I know we haven't used the word anti-Semitism, and I know that there's a desire for some to do that, and I have a desire too, I just don't have the agreement on that yet. So, and I will say that as, um, as a, a, when I was a boy, I remember quite vividly, whether in first grade or second grade, filling out these forms of what's your demographic? And I'm like, well, I'm not white. So what do I, what do I check? And I would often write in other and write Jewish as an ethnic group. Um, that my, um, my um, predecessors, my ancestors, um, who were in Lithuania, who were Jewish, um, they were not considered Lithuanians. They were Litvaks. They were Jews. Uh, it was separate. And, and I, I don't know that you have that in other religions, that a religion is also an ethnic group. Um, but for me and for many Jews, it's an ethnicity. It's not just a religion. Um, and for some, it's mostly an ethnicity, and they're not particularly religious. Um, but certainly with um, Hitler and, um, and for people celebrating the bar mitzvah in, in the Pittsburgh synagogue who were gunned down, um, there wasn't the question of, you know, are you Jewish um, or how Jewish are you? It's, um, it's all lumped together. And so that is an ethnicity for the, for the purposes of the bill, um, particularly with, with the religion spoken in the bill, um, I can see um, myself included there. So where we are right now is do we vote this bill out or do we postpone and get the Jewish community and the, and the coalition to give us different language? That's what we're waiting for. That's what we're trying to decide right now. So I will say that I've spoken with one of the three rabbis here who have testified mm -hmm. um, and got a, a green light. Um, I haven't spoken to the others, mm -hmm. so to, and, and I haven't spoken to, I know that there were other members of this body mm -hmm. who were concerned about um, this, and so I haven't spoken to them, so I can't speak for them, and I also don't speak for the entire <laughs> Jewish community. Um, you got a green light on that. To, to move forward as with, with these changes. Okay. Um, so to the extent that, that uh, a one-day postponement would allow there to be more communication and more support. For the coalition and, and the Jewish community to, to give us the language that is acceptable to both. Right, because the, the Jewish community and the coalition have not had the opportunity right. to get together just out of time limitations right. and you know how quickly you're moving on this yeah. um, and we just haven't literally had the time to connect yeah. as we're just finding out about things as they're happening. Do you think that you could help to facilitate that conversation with Amanda and the coalition? Do you need to help? I would, I've, I've already reached out to her, um, or last night I did, um, just via email, but I, I, I don't know her, um, we've never spoken, um, but I'd, I'd be more than happy to, to talk to her. Um, we are on the floor at one o'clock tomorrow, 
Could be, would it be possible to get to try to get the other two rabbis? Because I yes. feel like if all three rabbis were okay with this language, I think we'd be okay. Mm -hmm. um, Knowing that there's the option to to make the corrections in the yes. summary, right. just spoke to yes. the leader. And that, and that, 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 so thank you for, for saying that because that, that was part of the conversation yeah. was that knowing that, that we still want this to move forward and that some of these uh, concerns um, should continue to be addressed and discussed. So could you talk to, to the other two? Yes, I'll, I'll, I could reach out to them you know, okay. <laughs> by 1 o'clock tomorrow, <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, just a little bit of information for the committee based off of some conversations. Um, I had a chance to connect with Amanda a little bit from the coalition. Um, she is trying to pull together a meeting of the various members to talk through some of the issues that have come up and try to figure out what consensus looks like. Um, she said that she needs time to do that, um, possibly 48 hours. That's a lot of time, given our, our time. Um, on the other hand, just a process note for everyone is that uh, the clerk's office, in order for an amendment where we to offer a substitute amendment as a committee containing all of the points that have been worked on today, in order for that to be published in tomorrow's calendar, we would have to turn it in tonight. So we are up against that timeline. Um, but if we need more time to hear feedback from uh, some of the folks who provided testimony today, from members of the coalition who would like to discuss this, and give time to the work that needs to be done, uh, perhaps it does make sense to pause, to do a bit of a delay, recognizing that we want to make sure we do this right. Um, and so I just offer that to the committee as a couple of observations here. 48 hours is a long time. Um, if we're looking at 5 o'clock with 48 hours, that means that nothing happens until Friday, which is really late in this game. And at the same time, we can do Friday. It's just that we'd be postponing it several, you know. We'd be standing up a couple of times and postponing. Yeah. Taylor, do you get the sense that Amanda would prefer that we voted, you know, get it moving today instead of or, or and so the, and the, so the work will be done on the other side there? Or, or do you think? I, I don't want to speak for Amanda personally or for the individual members of the coalition personally. But I think that because uh, significant concerns have been brought forward um, in the interest of finding a successful bill, I think that they're willing to work through it. And more time is probably uh, more important at this moment than uh, immediately having a vote and it moving, recognizing that everyone wants to see this bill move. Right. And I, I know that. Can I just say this? Yeah. Go ahead. When, when do bills have to be for this session? When do bills have to be? We've got plenty of time. Oh, oh we do. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought, well, I, I, thought, I thought January 31st is No, that's, no. that's when we that's make perfect. a request to, to okay. have a bill drafted. Okay. So we, we have plenty of time. We have until the middle of March. But Correct me if I'm wrong, but the reason we're trying to hurry this thing through is so that we can amend curriculums a year prior to, yeah. you know, we don't want to. I Ac see. Accidentally push it over so that there's another year that right, the, right, the right. stuff isn't top. Right. <laughs> we, have to, we have to get it into the curriculum. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just didn't want to lose. Okay. Pause. Pause. And and Dylan, will you um, work to get those groups to communicate ASAP? Can I? What was yeah. it? Dylan, do you want to pause or do you want to move it? Um, I want to see a good outcome. You want to see it? a good outcome. <clears throat> I've also been given somewhat of a reprieve from the back office over there that I don't have the, you've got to get this out. <laughs> We've been given more time from the back 48 office. 48 hours. Good. <laughs> 
Okay. Yeah. Is there a version? Is there some changes that we did? You want that version posted? You want to go through it? Uh, the, the version. Um, yeah. Let's, let's just let's quickly do that. Okay. Four point one. Yeah. We're not voting on anything right now, so okay. that's fine. And, and we're going to post it. Good. I got it. I can vote for you while you're trying to have Take a seat. Yeah. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you, Jason. Yes. Anything you can do to facilitate our this group working together, we're always happy when those groups are happy. Oh no, I just want to make that uh, Did you want some um, comedy? Did you? Oh, oh yes, yeah, so there's Jason. comedy routines. Is that your yes. cup? Yes. Oh, <laughs> there's a cup under here. There's a cup. No, that yeah. is not. Oh, that might be Amy's. What is Amy's? Anyone? Why is this not on the All right, so the changes are highlighted in yellow. Um, so on page three, uh, line eight, I deleted the, the word farms in that list. Uh, we had a very good comment from an English professor over here who noted that the word damages should be damage on line 12. That's been changed. Thank you. Uh, and then um, groups. Rather than, my, rather than minorities on line 19. Um, and then we go up to uh, ableist on line 3. And ethnic and social biases on line 6. And that was it. Okay with that so far, and um, we'll be moving. We'll be hoping to get that those two groups talking and come to some kind of language that they can agree upon. Good. That we agree. Such a good process. It, it's 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 why I say when you get to this, why we have problems. So this is the sausage making. We, this <laughs> is the sausage making. That's exactly right. So. Maybe thank you yep. for hanging in here. Yep. Really appreciate the thoughtful questions and care for this really important issue. Thank you. <coughs> so we're off tomorrow. Yeah, um, we'll be here tomorrow. tomorrow at nine. nine.